good afternoon, Xbox Nation. Welcome to this week's new episode of the Xbox Factor Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Mr. Boomstick XL, and my God, do we have an incredible show for you packed with brand new, hot off the presses Xbox information. And one of the main reasons why you tune into this program each and every week. Now, for a lot of folks that don't know, because I can't sit still for a second, and three live shows weekly apparently weren't enough for me, there is a new Xbox show. That's right, Xbox One-on-One. That is a new show that I launched with Zemi. Now, why it's different is because for the 2021 campaign, Zemi and I are going to be covering two games per show. Now, it is not a two-hour show. It is a 60-minute show that could potentially run a little bit over, but because there are so many incredible Xbox experiences coming this year, I wanted to do a new show. It is a limited series. If the audience is there, if I get the views, if the people like it, then we will continue every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for one hour, and we're going to be talking about the hottest and biggest games on the Xbox coming in 2021. Now, of course, we will course correct if there is breaking news, like like, let's say uh, Microsoft buys Capcom. You can understand that we're going to cover that, but for the most part, it is going to be covering some of the biggest games, and I hope that you guys and gals who support the Xbox Factor podcast will come around on Tuesdays and support Zemi and I on this new venture. So let's get into the introductions so we can get right down to, of course, why you folks are here at first. The man of the hour, who is considered by many the bravest gamer this side of Texas, who is also a part-time chef. Please welcome the cog that keeps this show running, Zemi Game. Well, thank you so much, man, for that fantastic uh, intro. The bravest gamer. Um, I, yeah, no, no I'm, I'm most certainly not that. But, uh, but man, it was a pleasure doing, um, you know, the first uh, Xbox one on one with you this Tuesday. That was an amazing show. Hopefully uh, people uh, like it, you know, as, as much as I loved and I know you love doing it. It was absolutely fantastic. But now it's time for the Xbox Factor podcast. I can't wait. Uh, there's two topics with two spooky games. So I don't know how much I'm gonna have to say about those, but uh, I'm still excited nonetheless to be here, man. Well, it's great to have you a part of this program. Of course, it's great to have you a part of Xbox One-on-One. Next up, he's on loan from PlayStation Nation, representing the Halo brand in the best way possible, the subtle voice of the trophy room. Please welcome the COVID-free and recovered Mr. Bad Bit. What's up? What's up? What's going on, everybody? Hello. Hi. Yeah, I'm pretty much completely, I'm there. I got I got some fatigue. Yeah. I got a little bit more mind fog, which is such a weird thing to say. But I'm pretty much here. I'm excited. I'm really excited today is Resident Evil uh, Showcase. Yes. What we'll see, we don't know. But I'm excited to see the sexy tall vampire lady in all her sexy tall vampire lady <laughs> ways. <laughs> you see the internet thirst for that woman? Well, Jeez, dude, first of all, when she bent down to get into the room, you realized you were in trouble. I mean, she's yeah. nine feet tall, uh, and that, and like you know, she's gonna like she's gonna like because she's supposed to be like I, I assume the Mister X of this of this. I game. would imagine so. Yes, you know, she's gonna like like rip in half, and it's like a like a I don't know, like a Venus flytrap looking monster trying to eat you. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you know, it's gonna be terrifying. So I well, don't know what's up with this. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I believe it is going to be 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on uh, New York time, which I'm, I'll be just walking back into the house. Uh, I'm going to check that out. And of course, uh, Joe, you'll be on tomorrow morning's Breakfast with Boom. That is one of the major topics. Uh, we have an incredible show uh, tomorrow. Uh, a real, a real talk, Boom. Can I be? Can I be honest with you for a second? Sure. sure. Ignore the t-shirts um i really could like because i i wanted to we're, we're going to be streaming it on the trophy room at five i nice. wanted you to be a part of it but i know you're like you pick up your wife at that yes time. yes 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 so I, I, I'm, it, yeah it annoys me because i'm like why just do it like a little later what 5 p.m people are getting out of work here 
people getting work, know. people are making supper. Yeah, it's it's a it's a little weird, but again, they're going by California time, mm. so it makes sense. It's midday; people are just coming back from lunch. They figured, what the hell? But yeah, yeah listen, with that, it, they are already ignoring completely Europe because in Europe it's in the middle of the night. Yeah, there yeah. you go. I a once again, earlier, you know, everyone would have the chance to watch it. Yeah, Do you yeah, think? Yeah. We- like a, it's um because they're a Japanese company, so maybe maybe it's like nine o'clock in Japan, and that's why it might be. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a time thing, and I think for them, it's the correct time for everyone else. It's an inconvenient time for sure. Mm. But you know, speaking of uh, across the world, our next panel member is someone that dropped not one but two record-breaking videos for his incredible channel. One is sitting at 13,000 views. The other sitting at 17. Folks, this is an up-and-coming dude that found his way to this podcast. We're proud to have him. Please welcome Archimedes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a fantastic week. I'm in a particularly good mood. Uh, my two videos, like you said, uh, that I uploaded this week were record-breaking for me. Um it might not be a big click number for for the big YouTube channels, but for a small guy like guy like me, yes. um, yep. fifteen thousand plus minus uh, clicks is huge, and I couldn't be happier about that. But I'm also super excited for today's show. We have some really awesome topics we are going to talk about, and it's always great to be on the panel with Sammy with a uh, three bit V chain. And of course, a bad bit and you. Um, so I can't wait for today's show. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for being here as always. And yes, congratulations on that huge success. It's always great to see the little guy uh, nudge past or up, uh, you know, rub shoulders against some of the uh, YouTubers. Because the one thing about the YouTube community, uh, besides it sometimes being toxic, for the most part, it's great to see these small content creators getting seen, getting heard, making headway, because it does take a lot of time to put these videos together. Uh, it does certainly take a lot of time to write these scripts and put these shows together. So when we succeed, uh, we are even more happy because of obviously the hard work is being paid for in full. Uh, but uh, again, congratulations on that. Next up, our next guest is an award-winning or at least nominated uh, uh, unbelievable artist. Please welcome back to the show, 3-Bit. What's up, dude? How you doing? <laughs> Thanks so much for the uh, amazing intros every week. And, and congrats to uh, Archimedes on the record-breaking content. It's awesome. And uh, I, I can't wait for uh, these awesome topics. And everyone, be sure to hit the like button and share out the show because we have uh, – a lot of awesome topics to get through today. Uh, I I haven't seen the RE showcase. I don't know if that's later today, but yeah, it's later. I, it's going to be at five p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I believe it's two, it starts at two p.m. West Coast time. Ooh, I, I'm really excited to uh, see that. But yeah, uh, personally, I, I've been uh, pretty busy just working on some content behind the scenes, and and uh, but I'm ready to get into uh, some of these topics. So let's let's get to get into it. Well, it's great to have you back here. And last, and in no way least, making his return, someone that has an incredible way of explaining his opinion. He thinks he talks too much. I don't think he talks enough. Please welcome VJ. Morning, Boom. How are you? How's everyone on the panel? Excellent, um, excellent. Hopefully you've had your spot of tea, my friend. Uh, yeah, I've just I've just had a cup of tea just before the show. Excellent, excellent. Well, we know that you are ready to rock and roll, so let's get into it, folks. Now, first of all, we have 150 people here already. That's great. Uh, it was great. We definitely appreciate you guys and gals coming out to support this. I will ask that if you're here and you enjoy the content, it does really help the channel grow when you hit that like button. So do not worry. I won't send you a bill for five dollars every time you hit the bell, uh, that, uh, the like button. And of course, you if you're new, if you're someone that is looking for positive content surrounding the Xbox brand where we only talk negative when we need to never to generate clicks, please consider subscribing. Hit that subscribe button. And maybe if you are already a fan and you enjoy the work that I put into, consider becoming a channel member. All you have to do is hit that channel button. It's five bucks a month and it's your way of telling me that you're enjoying the content and you're helping Double Barrel Gaming. But let's get into, of course, 
topic number one. Now, one of the biggest OG Xbox exclusives, uh, of course, to this day, was the 2004 release of Ninja Gaiden from Team Ninja and the then director of the project, Tomonobu Itagaki, who left Team Ninja right after its sequel of the rebooted franchise that saw its first release on the Nintendo NES system. Now, thanks to a story that's been running wild both on social media and mainstream gaming, we now know that the legendary creator has come back to game development with his newly founded studio called Itagaki Games, which was announced on January 17th, 2021. Now, we do have confirmation, not only from him, but from Phil Spencer and many people within within Microsoft, that they have had a very strong working relationship with him in the past. And obviously, he said some things that set the internet ablaze on his official Facebook uh, page, where he was talking about potentially going back to work for Microsoft. Now, the 53-year-old designer was straight to the point and had a few interesting things to say about Microsoft and Team Xbox. And here are those quotes. He says this, For the past four years, I've been teaching uh, to Forster Junior developers, but now I feel like I want to make a game again and just established a company for that purpose. I would start again with questions that I made to original Xbox designer Seamus Blackley two decades ago. But then I asked him, are you confident that you will beat PlayStation 2? And he said, yes. Xbox is called Project Midway and I'll gain the supremacy with it. Then he finishes it off with saying, that's why I trusted him and actually created an Xbox exclusive game for about 10 years. 20 years have passed since then, and I've established my own company, Itagaki Games, which is not Tecmo nor Valhalla Studios. I know Microsoft is still aggressive. If they reach out to me, it will be an honor. Now, here's the thing, folks. One of the genres that is missed currently, if you look at the Xbox portfolio, is a third-person, story-driven, action-adventure title like Ninja Gaiden. Now, we have seen those games from third parties and second parties, but we don't have any of those in the first party. Now, granted, um, Compulsion Games is working on a third-person type of game that combines horror from, of course, Bioshock and an, an Uncharted-esque kind of adventure. That's great. We also have, of course, Hellblade 2, which we're going to be talking about later on in the program. But it would be pretty damn awesome if he could create a, uh, a successor, if you will, to Ninja Gaiden. Which, by the way, if you play it now, that game looks absolutely stunning on the o uh, on the Xbox One X, uh, One X, One S, the uh, Xbox Series X, or of course the S. It, it's backwards compatible, and if you've never played it, somehow you've missed that game. I highly recommend to go try it. So, I mean, let's get to you on this. This is a story that has taken uh, the media by storm because Itagaki, regardless of his age and how long he's been away from gaming. We still can't deny that the guy might have another game or two up his sleeves, potentially something that he talked with with Microsoft before leaving Team Ninja and just couldn't get off the ground with Valhalla Studios. If you were in charge, would you consider picking up his studio and potentially getting him to make a game exclusively for your Xbox? Yeah, so I mean, from for, if I was in charge, and for what I know right now, which obviously if I was in charge, I would have access to a lot more information, of course. But with what I know now, I would definitely be looking at making this happen. Um, you know, we 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 know that Xbox um, has this this huge need slash desire for a Japanese studio, or you know, a, or or someone making Japanese themed games for you know Xbox Game Pass, or just you know, in, in some capacity of that, right? They've spent a lot of time in Japan talking with developers and publishers, everything like that. 
So I would definitely be trying to make something happen. I don't know if you know, an acquisition would be likely or, um, you know, for me personally, I think it would be more likely to see um, uh, Itagaki, uh, you know, start creating second party games for the Xbox um, rather than a full acquisition. And the reason I say that is because, you know, we do know that Xbox has been spending a lot of time in Japan. We don't exactly know what other moves they have out on the table. We don't know if they're currently in the process of maybe you know acquiring um, a big publisher or a big developer already in that region. So I I, I don't feel confident you know enough to say that you know I, I you know we would see an acquisition with this, but I definitely see a lot of potential for Xbox getting um, Itagaki uh, games to make a second party game. Um, to 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 put up on the platform in Game Pass or 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 however you know whatever capacity that might be. Um, I just you know because there's just so much out on the table. I don't know if I would necessarily say that I think they're going to get acquired. Um, but yeah, for sure. If I was in you know a leadership role at Xbox and knowing what I you know know right now at this moment, I, I think it would be a very very smart choice because. You know, Japanese um, themed games is is something still Xbox is kind of running flat on, especially in the first party lineup, especially on Game Pass, you know, compared to other genres that they have. And we know, you know, we talk about this. We have talked about this on so many shows previously, but Xbox has huge interests in that region, you know, in in in, in Japan, in South Korea. Um, that That is going to be a, a absolutely huge potential market for them, especially with mobile gaming um, on, on smartphones with the xCloud app. So it, it makes all the sense of why they would want to get as many Japanese uh, games or studios on their team as possible. And you know what? I agree. I, I, I love I love your I love your your uh, the way you're thinking here because obviously um, ja Japanese based games that you see very, that that are very extremely popular on the PlayStation brand as well, of course, as the Nintendo brand. Um, are something that Microsoft is looking to change. We've heard we've heard Phil Spencer say in the past that it actually it it hurts him when a game is released for those two consoles and not his platform. Mm -hmm. And I obviously all the handshaking and elbow rubbing he's been doing over the course of the last twenty four months shows that their their commitment to that region of the world is as strong as it is here. And Itagaki is a name. Uh, that is uh, still very popular, very well respected in that region of the world. And I think that if Microsoft could get him to, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, pencil to uh, paper on of his ideas and bring something as uh, potentially legendary as a new action, um, you know, adventure IP, whether it's with a ninja or not, I don't know. But I know that he is still someone that is looked upon as someone that has talent. Uh, he has put his talent on hold for a couple of years, but it doesn't mean that the talent is cold. He just needs an opportunity. And I think that Microsoft, uh, may, maybe they don't acquire Itagaki games now. Maybe he releases said new game. It does gangbuster numbers. It's beautiful. It gets high meta. And they're like, yeah, we got to get this guy involved. And they and, and then sometime down the line, they consider to pick him up. That That's pretty interesting. Joe, let's go to you being you jumped yeah. on the camera. Now, mm -hmm. Itagaki is a name that uh, may, maybe a lot of people don't know. He is, of course, the creator of Ninja Gaiden, which we already know and established, but he's also mm -hmm. the creator of Dead or, Dead or Alive, which is a fantastic fighter that has rubbed elbows and been in the same uh, conversation as Tekken and Street Fighter. Yeah. And it is, um, you know, this is a this is a developer and, and slash designer creator that I think still has some gas in the tank. When you hear he's publicly reaching out to Microsoft, do you think that Microsoft is going to reach back? Um, it's definitely a wait and see approach. I think for me, I'm more cold on the idea than actually like red hot. Let's go. Let's, let's do this. Um, you know, two things come to mind. And I know one of them isn't a, a one-to-one, -one, but we, we've seen, uh, you know, like mighty number no. nine is a good example of like people that, um, have a long relationship with an IP promising a spiritual successor to, and it just not panning out um, and, and kind of crashing and burning. 
Uh, I could take a better example, which would be like Bethesda and uh, Tango Gameworks. Like, you know, you have the creator there of what, Resident Evil 4, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's just like, yo, I'm going to make a game. And then, um, you know, they make that deal with Bethesda and Evil Within doesn't hit the way, uh, you know, people wanted to. And unfortunately, though, I hear good things about the sequel. Neither does that one. So, like, is that a really good investment? You can even take a look at Sony and Kojima, right? Sony infused Kojima with cash to get this studio started. Death Stranding comes out. I personally like it. But look, that is a game that didn't set the world on fire, right? So, like, you know, you're taking a look at these legendary uh, creators um, coming out there and not exactly hitting the home runs you want. Not to mention that, you know, um, I I can't pronounce his name. I'm sorry. I'm from Jersey and I'm bad. But, um, you know, he's, you know, he's 53. Yeah, Itagaki. Itagaki. Thank you so much. You know, he's 53 years old. So, like, if... If you're going to purchase this studio, why are you purchasing this studio? Like, if I'm wearing a suit and tie, is it literally just for this guy's name? If a game comes out every, what, four, three or three to four years, this guy's going to be like, you know, 56, 57. And then his next game comes out, he's going to be around in his 60s. And that's usually when, you know, people start thinking about retirement. So, like, how long are you really going to have this guy? Um, and how, how long do, do you think as, as a studio, you know, if he doesn't have a protege with him, how, how much of that talent are you really going to kind of squeeze out just for Ninja Gaiden, uh, or, or spiritual successor too, which look, I get it. You love Ninja Gaiden and I'm not here to shit all over it, but that, that game. And I, I, I appreciate it because it will always kick my ass, but <laughs> when it comes to those games, those are a super niche uh, audience, a super cult following audience. Um, and when those games hit, they hit, but when they don't, they don't. So like when, when I take a look at that, if I'm Microsoft, I'm way more apprehensive about going in there and purchasing a studio just because it's a Japanese studio. I think if I am Phil Spencer, I really want to continue making some deals with folks And I really want to take a look at how my current portfolio does with xCloud being introduced. Right. Because if you can penetrate that audience with your titles uh, on xCloud and having that $15 fee kind of, you know, uh, hook into the Japanese gamer mind, then that's what you that's that's what you want you you, or at least have a sense to go with because your mission if you're phil spencer is not to sell consoles in japan and i think the last no i think we've we've, we've covered that joan i think i think it's safe to say that that's not probably going to happen though it potentially could with a smaller console but i think that that that, those regions of the world where mexico you gotta have that club yeah, yeah. You, XCloud is going to be the way because th- that that culture has gone from, uh, you know, in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s as being a very console heavy uh, consumer to now playing in cafes, now playing yep. on their train, playing on their phone, playing on their tablets, playing on their PCs. So and is that game going to translate to that screen? That and is if, the question. You know, yeah. And, well, and I think I, three could, could call my bullshit on this. But if you're a developer, you're probably now starting to think of how is a game not just being played on a TV, but now now I have to put in that mobile experience of, okay, this screen is like 10 times smaller than my TV. How, how am I going to uh, to deal with that like UI and, and mechanics type? Yeah, wise? I think in, in some ways they, they have to think about that. But also, um, and I know Kirby's in the chat. <laughs> you could definitely check all of us. But uh, if if you're building a game for like let's say PC and and uh, and uh, or, or a Copy. console, yeah, um, Unreal built in has uh, things <laughs> uh, built into the engine itself so that you can scale it to different platforms such as uh, Android devices or, or, mm. or just automatically. But I do know, um, like if you play Hellblade on X Cloud. Um, they have the sort of the the touch controls, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So Microsoft is building systems for uh, games like that, so developers can easily uh, 
yeah. you know, be able to to control that. So. Yeah, and when I think of a game like Ninja Gaiden, or like it, it, for me, it translates to a From Software game of those type of, of of experiences. It's like if I'm putting that on a phone, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, wh- wh- like how is that experience going to translate to that type of type of experience? Can it? You know. Well, an- you know, another thing that kind of goes to your point, uh, bad bit that I was that I was kind of thinking of, you know, while listening to you speak is, you know, it's it's also kind of strange how, you know, how he came out with this in almost like a public statement, um, right? Rather than actually going and, and sending an email to a contact at Xbox, you know, he's a big name, he has friends, he, you know, he still is working, you know, at more of, a, you know, in an education role, but he still has to have people contacts that work at Xbox or know people that work at Xbox, yeah. which to me almost seems like, and there's multiple scenarios that you could look at this, but to me, it, it's almost in some ways, like it's kind of like, like him putting pressure on Xbox to give him the light of day, if that makes any sense, or, or, or have well, kind fans of like, like trying to get like fans to go, yo, Phil, look yes. at this, like like what we're doing right now. Hey, Phil, yeah. look at this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Advertisement. Absolutely. He, he brings himself into the news with that. That would never happen if he just wrote an email to somebody at Xbox. Yeah. Um, I think that is that is his main strategy. I mean, we are talking now, <laughs> right now, in the podcast. If he would have wrote, written an email, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Sure. I mean, in this, I mean, ultimately it's free marketing, it's free publicity for his new company. I mean, is that, you know, so, I mean, that's just another way of viewing it and, and trying to, you know, maybe put that, it would take that into consideration of whenever talking about how likely this might be of Xbox being interested um, kind of thing. I mean, look, I'll say this. Um, there is no harm of Phil sitting down with him or Matt Booty sitting down with them, or the both of them sitting down with Itagaki and saying, hey, listen, we saw your message. Uh, we've worked together before. Ninja Gaiden did gangbuster numbers, uh, one and two, uh, when they were exclusive for the OG Xbox, because obviously two came out, and I, that one, I believe, was on the PlayStation 2 as well. But Ninja Gaiden and Ninja Gaiden Black, uh, or, which came out a year later in 2005, were both exclusives and big exclusives because even back then it pushed graphics in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, and and I got to tell you something. Um, I don't know what he's what he's thinking in that big brain of his, but it's his game that uh, are the reason why Joe, you're playing Bloodborne and people are enjoying Sekiro Sh- Shadows Die Twice. There's no doubt that his vision for Ninja Guide and how difficult it was at times was the uh, the blueprint for many of the games that we're playing today. Uh, now, again, I, I know he's 53. I know some people in the chat saying, well, he might be ready for uh, retirement. Well, he's been on hiatus for the last four years teaching. And I think that there comes a point where you're just no longer happy behind the classroom. You want to be behind the screen making the games, working with your team. And I think that we could see that. So there's certainly no harm in that. VJ, let's get your opinion on this, dude. Um, look, Itagaki is a name that carries a tremendous amount of weight and history. Now, to be fair, he has not done anything. And I believe the last game he did make that wind up uh, going to the uh, the Wii, I think it was, yeah, did not do very well. But with that said, him reaching out to Microsoft, knowing that they are not only being aggressive in the market, but want to bring a Japanese type experience to not only the Japanese gamers, but to the uh, uh, Western uh, gamers like us who are right now talking about this, does should Microsoft take a chance on him? Um, it's a it's a really difficult one, and it's I'm kind of straddling between um, Zemi and um, Mr. Badbit. Um, it's it's almost timing is so critical in this industry, and um, imagine if this, if he put this out in 2018 when Microsoft were on a spree of uh, picking up studios. Um, and uh, if you look at right now, um, what is it? Namco, Bandai, maybe Square Enix, Sony, Nintendo, Capcom, maybe Koei Tecmo, and maybe a few others. There's not that many, probably, you know, you can count them on two hands, that are probably capable of uh, offering 
uh, Itakagi, you know, the 40, 50, or maybe even 100 million, right, to build a studio and make a game. Because as far as I understand it, he's, he's got to build a studio. And that's, that's, an, incredible, that's an incredible effort um, in itself and requires him a tremendous amount of energy. Um, I guess Koei Tecmo can be ruled out since uh, no love is, is, I guess, is no love is really lost between them and Itagaki-san and the way he left. Um, it's uh, you've got to look at Japan. It's a tough time uh, socially and economically. Uh, also, in recent times, uh, everyone has um, been reminded of what can go wrong. And I just point to what Mr. 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 Badbit said, right? And uh, the people within the industry are still a little bit perturbed by the Sony uh, Kojima experiment, if that's if that's what you want to call it. What you want to call it? I mean, the the big acquisition money right now in recent times that I can think of has, has been from Tencent, right, buying. Uh, SNK indirectly for about 100 million, and they've obviously put a large capital investment into Platinum Games, uh, more visibly, more visibly and publicly. Even when Microsoft were once rumored to be interested, um, as I say, you've got to factor in the complex social and economic issues and scenarios which you sort of alluded to, Boom, and, and how the market has changed, uh, especially over the last 30 years. Uh, and more so in in recent times. I mention I'm kind of mentioning all of this because now you can understand somewhat as to why Itagagi has has offered himself to Microsoft on a plate or or sort of like I don't know you could perceive it as a plea to come and get me um I mean we know Itagagi right we've read interviews on him in the past and he's not he's not the easiest person to work with and create and most well I guess which creators are right and um and unless unless they're saddled with exceptional producers a topic uh, we've sort of fleetingly, fleetingly, but uh, commonly covered, you know, several times on the show. I think, I think if you look at Itagagi's sort of historic success, um, it did change him. It, it kind of transmogrified him and evolved him. He became a more force, forceful personality, a more outspoken personality, right, and more complex to relate to and work with, especially with with the teams that were in and around him. I mean, I mean, I'm not the most, I'm not the best historian, but since leaving Koei and Team Ninja 10, 10 years ago or whatever it was, you know, has he has he really had any commercial success to speak of? Um, not, I don't know. There's, not that I can recall yeah, it. There's a lot of risk, and I think what you said is right. You have to also build this studio, and I think that is more of a, a, of a call to, for investors more than a call to, I mean, Xbox for sure, but like, I, I do want to point out one thing, VJ, and then you can get back to your point. And I apologize. Is that like Tencent? Tencent is a force in, in the gaming uh, sphere. We often look past. They are looking to buy a major, a major company uh, mm -hmm. worth billions at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. So like, there, you know, yeah. there is this feeling in the air that, and again, it's always the thing that I was really scared of with, with Bethesda that. We're going to see a lot of these big companies, these big corporations, starting to buy publishers. That that's why. And again, this is this could be a topic for another show for sure, Joe. And you're right. I, I think that that is one of the reasons why Microsoft is not going to take their foot off the gas. Uh, and that's why, if you uh, if you've been reading, you Absolutely. know, the headlines Absolutely. and and the rumors that have been circling, um, Microsoft is prepared. And uh, from what we understand, is ready to announce the next uh, acquisition. And again, from someone that I know that I have talked to behind the scenes that has given me proper information before, has assured me that whatever it is that they're working on, it is bigger than Bethesda. And to say that out loud is not only exciting, uh, it's goosebump worthy, which is what's happening with me right now, because I start to start, you know, I start to think, well, then this is a this is a potentially a Capcom buyout, because that's what we've heard. And I don't think that's I don't know. I, I say, when I say I don't think that's going to happen, I don't know. I have no idea. But all I know is that Microsoft's aggressive behavior that you're seeing regarding um, uh, the spending spree that they went on is not going to end simply because um, even if they do allow some of these games to go uh, you know, to, to other consoles, which I still think, don't think they will, um, they do not want the 10 cents. They don't want Apple Corporation. They do not want Amazon or Google to lock up uh, a Capcom or a Ubisoft, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, that's major 
IPs that won't be on these consoles. So it's it's interesting. It's it's an interesting thought. Before we move on to the next topic, I do want to get three bits final opinion on this. Now, three bit. Listen from a, from a designer's point of view, and I, I really want you to tackle this question from that point of view because not only are you a gamer, not only are you a uh, you know a, a, a podcast professional, but you also work in the business and you are responsible for a lot of the handshaking deals that go on, and you are an artist at at your core. Knowing the history of Itagaki, knowing that when he puts his mind to it, he can, in fact, create incredible games. If you are sitting in Matt Booty's chair, I'm not saying we look to go buy Itagaki games, but he wants to work with Microsoft. Would do you do you, do you give this guy a chance to to bring a, a, a very unique action Japanese esque title to your console? Um, well, in terms of uh, recent acquisitions, Tango Gameworks is one of the more recent de developers. Uh, and that's Microsoft. a Japanese-based studio, yes. Yes, um, Microsoft has acquired, and it was only really acquired because it was underneath the umbrella of studios uh, of Bethesda, right? And it's a I think it's it's Itagaki. <laughs> it, yeah, Itagaki. Yes, um, and uh, Microsoft. They they've had a, a close relationship for, for many years. He did partner with Microsoft early in the original Xbox's development. He was one of the developers that did receive an early prototype uh, of the Xbox and, and tried to uh, launch a game um, for uh, as part of the launch titles for for the Xbox. And his work on Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive was incredible. Um, he's one of the first few developers I did recognize as a kid. You just sort of have that rock star status. He does, yeah. Um, I believe uh, one of the older Dead or Alive games on the original Xbox had like a behind the scenes disc, and I remember him popping up on G4 a lot back in the day on shows mm -hmm. like X-Play yes. and Playground, if you guys remember that channel. I do, um, yes. I I'd like to uh, put him sort of next to Kojima and in terms of that specific developer that would really benefit from having their IP back. Um, but if any deal is to happen between Itagaki and, and uh, it, it seems like it's, it's been quite some time. So I think Microsoft is going to want to wait. Um, but I, I've been hearing what you guys have been saying about like um, Tencent and Amazon. And, and we know there is a, a studio buyout right now. Um, but he still sort of, sort of doesn't need to, to prove himself again, <laughs> sadly, I think. Um, so, so while I know Microsoft is waiting for a Japanese studio to purchase, they're going to want to see what's successful. And uh, if anything, um, I, I, if anything, I do know Tango Gameworks partners up with a lot of talented directors. So that could be interesting. That's, that's uh, a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah, maybe them hiring him and seeing um, what happens over there um, as sort of a testing ground. And if, if that does well, then sure. Um, but yeah, I think despite everything, they're going to want to uh, see if he <laughs> if he still got it uh, pretty much. So because um, there's there's a lot of very talented directors out there um, that can really benefit from a studio purchase, but they just need to sort of prove themselves. So I think I do think this is one of those scenarios as well. Yeah. And uh, you know, Archimedes, let, let's get your, your opinion on this. I almost forgot. Thank thanks for Zemi with the saves. Uh, Archimedes, <laughs> look, the Microsoft is doing things much different. Uh, not just in this generation, the new generation that just start. Closing out the generation, th they're obviously were fixing mistakes that were made, stumbles, if you will. Uh, in the opening act of 2013 and moving forward. And we obviously knew that a lot of those changes came when Phil Spencer was promoted to his power position that he's currently in in late 2017. With that said, because Phil is a gamer, because they have plans for the Asian region of the world with with Project X Cloud, Itagaki is a name that still, again, still empowers. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, best way to say it is that he's his name still sells, and I think that regardless of how big or small his game is, if I'm Microsoft. And I hear that he's reaching out to us. I, I think I got to have a conversation. Do you think Phil needs to sit down with him and see what he is talking about? <laughs> yeah, like Vijay said, that's a complex question. Um, 
Of course, uh, he or Phil or, or Microsoft X Team Xbox should talk to him. I mean, he is a big name and he's obviously looking for a collaboration of some kind, um, either with Xbox or somebody else. I mean, it's tough in these times to build up a studio from the ground up and um, that's a huge task he has ahead of him. Um, and that's probably also the reason why Microsoft isn't that interested in, in an acquisition because do they really want to build up a new studio just with his name or do they want to have like they did in the did it in the past uh, do they want to have a smaller studio that has a working chemistry within the studio and just uh, give them room to grow and that's probably more the strategy that Microsoft is pursuing however um, Microsoft is also trying to get more diversity into Game Pass. And what is missing right now, it's definitely those um, those those Japanese bangers. Um, of course, we have the Jakusa games now in there, but still, the, the Japanese games are missing there. And so it could be a perfect um, time for them to do a second party deal. That's something that they haven't done in a while, um, something that Sony is doing very well. They partner up with um, third-party publishers and make them exclusives. And why shouldn't Microsoft do it uh, with Itagaki-san? Um, I mean, that's definitely something they could look into. And a Ninja Gaiden kind of game uh, would be awesome. Um, but at this point, we still don't know whether he wants to make such a game or whether he has something else in mind. Um, so in the end, it's 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 a difficult uh, question. I know. The, the the Xbox gamers mind always jumps to the to acquisition acquisition because we've had so many over the last two or three years mm -hmm. um but not every collaboration does need to be a um uh, a, an acquisition yeah um just look at the Asobo uh, team yeah they didn't get acquired uh, but they are uh strongly collaborating with Xbox and why shouldn't itagaki san do that yeah, and, and again, folks, it's 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 going to be a, a conversation that's going to gain some traction. Uh, if I, I, I'm going to say this, knowing Microsoft, knowing what their plans are for the future of the brand, not just in this country, not just in Europe, not just in Mexico and Australia, where they do very well, uh, they're looking to uh, become relevant and a part of the conversation in the Asian regions, of course, in Japan and, uh, you know, Korea, for instance. Uh, and I think that is why you've seen games um, like Crossfire X being rebuilt from the ground up to launch in Game Pass in Korea, because that is still one of the best uh, played games there. Uh, it's why Final uh, it's uh, Fantasy Star Online 2 is as big as it is because it's still a game that's played in Japan, in these cafes that we talked about early on in this conversation. And like I said, I don't know what he has cooking, but I think that we do know for a fact that one of the missing genres from Microsoft, uh, and, and many people have been asking for it, including myself, is that third-person, over-the-shoulder, story-driven content. And we are going to get that from their first party, but it would be great to see them go back to some roots that helped them grow to the Xbox brand in the OG days and the 360 days with these second-party deals. I think that it's something that Sony does very well. It's something that Sony has done this entire generation and to great, great success. My mic went. Okay, that my sorry about that. My son, my, yeah, my, no, my, like, oh, no, 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 my, 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 yeah, my mic cut out for a second. Okay, well, I'm back. Uh, listen, let's let's move on. Let's move on to um, topic number two. Now, this one is a good one. I think we're gonna have a lot to hear from Zemi on this one because it's <laughs> eh, we're gonna talk about we're gonna, now. This particular show, we, we are, we're privileged today. We're, we're talking about Ninja Theory, but we're not talking about Ninja Theory on just one topic in Hellblade. We got some new Project Mara info that we're going to get to momentarily, but I definitely want to get to um, the topic number two here. And of course, we're going to be talking about um, Hellblade 2. Now, in 2019, as we all know, the gaming world was basically, like the kids say, shook when they saw early footage from Team Ninja's Senua Saga Hellblade 2. And from what I've heard, through numerous channels that I use to get some information from, 
The game series has been in active development for several years now, though unfortunately we do not have an official or solid release date as of this show. Well, thanks to a Twitter post from the actress playing Senua, Melina Jurgens, we have confirmation that Team Ninja is back in the studio doing mocap work. Now, this is huge because for most of the 2020 campaign, films as well as studios that make games uh, using mocap for video games were shut down due to COVID-19. And of course, with all the restrictions that are still in place, with COVID still being out of control the way it is, it's great to know that they are taking precautions to keep their actors, actresses, and of course, the staff safe, but they're back in the studio making this game. Now, what's, what's, the big question of today's particular topic is where are they in development? Is this, you know, mocap work to finish telling the story? Is this somewhere in the beginning? Are we two years away? Are we three years away? Or is Hellblade 2 one of the games that are the one of the AAA games that were rumored to launch this year? I, I honestly don't know, but we're certainly going to talk about it. Now, in the story that I pulled from comicbook.com, the image that popped up on uh, um, uh, Miss Jurgen's uh, Twitter account with her wearing the face paint um, does suggest that she is obviously filming uh, Senua in this game. Now, what's interesting is why she decided to put that up. Because obviously that had to be approved not only by Microsoft, but Ninja Theory as well. And this didn't come through Ninja Theory or Microsoft. This came through her personal Twitter account. And that's pretty interesting. Uh, and that's also exciting. Now, the excitement surrounding the sequel of the award-winning Sanua's Sacrifice, Hellblade 1, is huge for several reasons, but the biggest one is that it's a major AAA title, and it's an exclusive for the Xbox Series X and S. Now, the question I have for the panel, I'm going to go right, right to Zemi on this. Uh, the question here is actually quite <clears throat> simple, Zemi. Mean, there's two of them. <clears throat> um, with this game in active development, and we know that it's been in active development uh, two big AAA titles are releasing in 2021. Do you think Hellblade 2 is actually one of them? Or is this a game we're going to see maybe in the early parts of 2022? Yeah, I mean, so I think it's possible that we could see it this year. I mean, any, you know, from what we know, from what, you know, we've heard and we've seen, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's possible. Uh, but I think the better question, is it likely? And and to me personally, from, you know, just me looking at it and, and um, just thinking about it, you know, quietly in my corner over here, um, if I was a betting man, I would say it's still a bit too soon to expect it to come out this year. I, I really think 2022 is is the year that this game is probably going to come out um i'm not an expert in you know software development or how motion capture you know fits into production timelines if there's reshoots or or how any of that behind the scenes kind of stuff goes uh, i mean three bit you know uh archimedes maybe even vj would probably have a lot more to say on on, on that type of stuff and and just you know production timelines for projects like this but you know it, it just still seems a bit too early um, you know, especially, you know, considering that we haven't seen gameplay of this game and and then also considering that, you know, the, the current world situation and how uh, a lot of games are facing delays right now. Um, I'm not going to say that maybe it wasn't their plan to come out 2021, but I, 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 I from from what I'm seeing, from what I'm thinking, I, I think 2022 is really the time to, to to to, you know, point towards this game coming out. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's it certainly to give yourself room to launch early uh, in uh, 2022 uh, would give the not only the game the audience that it necessarily deserves, but obviously, you know, we don't know how close this game is. And do you really want to fight off um, a, a fall game that we know is coming in the form of a mm -hmm. new Call of Duty, potentially a new Assassin's Creed and a few of the other big ones? Oh, and Halo. And, and, I believe and as for well. instance, and yeah. that's a great point. Uh, Halo's coming out again. We 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 all believe it's uh, you know 11, 15, 2021. We don't have confirmation, but I think Microsoft is going to uh, uh, you know release it around there. Joe, let, let's get your opinion on this. Now, listen, we if if you look at how many people made Hellblade One, it's a group of twenty people. 
They did yeah. it with, with the smallest budget possible, and um, the game was a masterpiece. It's, it's a loud. masterpiece of storytelling, but more importantly, it really does focus on mental illness, especially if you take the time to play that game wearing headphones. You get an understanding of what she's suffering from and how people, real people, in the world could potentially be suffering the same way. And it's, it's a subject that's touchy for many, uh, but it's mm. a subject that is important to the team uh, at Ninja Theory. And they are once again, continuing this incredible IP with a follow-up. Now yeah. I would imagine that this follow-up is going to potentially be much bigger than the original title because the team is much bigger. So obviously they have a lot of established, uh, you know, um, art they have the IP, which is established, which was re released on multiple platforms. For you, is this a 2021 game? Uh, no. No, 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 no. And when I even think early 22, I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, I definitely think this is... I'm very negative today. Let me get happy. That's not so much negative. Well, so, <laughs> first off... Um, yeah, no, Hellblade's fantastic. And I I was thinking about it the other day. Man, I love you're already kind of seeing that Microsoft wants to have these th this broad scope with their IP in terms of like their mascots, which is awesome. Like well, like to see that by the time Hellblade 2 comes out, you know, Senua is going to be a mascot for Xbox is awesome. Like that's awesome for multiple reasons, right? Uh female empowerment, that's cool as as all hell and you're also moving away from, you know, the master chief being like the lone icon, him him and Marcus. So, it's it's awesome to to see people get psyched when they see the actress for Senua. It's, that's really awesome. It's definitely a PR move by uh Ninja Theory to go, "Hey, hey, hey you know, share share it so that, you know, you get the fans excited for what we're cooking." Um if I'm understanding correctly though mocap doesn't necessarily mean the game's close to finish or close to done um it just necessarily means if i'm again and three bit you can tell me if i'm full of shit um it, it pretty much means you got a lot of the story beats down um you got a lot of or let's just say you're making a trailer at this very moment uh and probably you're getting some of the movement now like that you're going to be seeing in this game in terms of like the action, uh, like like when she's swinging swords and whatnot, mm -hmm. you're getting that down as well. Yeah, what's up, three bit? Yeah, I was just saying could be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like when I'm taking a look at uh, God of War, uh, they did mocap before they were done with half of that game. So you know, it, I don't think this necessarily means it's close. I think this just this just means get excited because we're back and we're working. Mm. in this studio now you know it's more of a like you know a middle finger to covid more than like more than anything which is awesome to see i would really really i i, I really think that this is a 2022 game not so much uh let me see maybe maybe spring maybe maybe but i would really want to see this as their fall game in 2022 man like going hey this is a staple this is this is we we know this works we know this sells we know people are hyped for it let's let's give it the big triple a marketing it deserves launch that in the in the in in september and you got you got something there but i don't necessarily think this means anything's close to done yet uh, yeah, but I, I'm excited though. I'm so yeah. excited. Well, I mean, the the, inf the the pure fact that they're back in the studio says yeah. a lot. Uh, says a lot for the industry as a whole. But says more. Also, importantly, let's just say one thing as well. Sure. I'm sorry. Sure. Project Mara, I think, kind of confirms we're living in a simulation because that was too real. And I literally, I'm like, I'm looking at those images and it's crazy. I, I, I forget. I'm, I'm. I think Luke Lore said it, so I'll just say it's an original thought for me here. But like, this could really, really, really be Xbox's PT again. Original thought, not yes. Luke Lore's. And like, that gets me hyped. I, it, I immediately think when I saw like the water in the sink, I'm like, when are we going to get? And if is there actually that uncanny valley where people are like, 
all right, this is too real. You know, like, are we actually going to get there? Or is this yeah, like. Well, actually, we're, we're going to definitely. This is not the the only Ninja Gaiden talk. I'm Ninja yeah. Gaiden. Ninja Theory oh, talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm jumping that far ahead. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to actually cover that next because, yeah, there's a lot to talk about uh, on a game that we had no information. And now we have a yeah. waterfall of information yeah. about. But what you say we might be living in the Matrix. Yeah, no, that's, that's, it, it's very possible. Three bit. Let's. I want to get you in on the conversation because, from a designer's point of view, Joe made a great point that says just because they're doing mocap doesn't necessarily mean the game is close. But that's also doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't working on the game and they just the mocap aspect of it they needed to finish or they needed to do, redo. This, this this could be touch up work. This could be additional work being added this could be work that was halted because of covid uh we we don't know they did not say but we do know that they're back in the studio for you and knowing how this production works behind the scenes how likely or unlikely are we to see hellblade 2 senua saga in 2021 well i'm gonna put a my math hat on here for a bit <laughs> uh the, so the original Hellblade took about three years to develop. Correct. It was, it was announced, um, and and the new one uh, was announced. I think in December 2019. Yes, that's so, when we first saw the uh, the trailer for it. So it's been about fourteen or so months since that initial trailer, and and that trailer did already have some amazing mocap and, and facial expressions, which means it's fair to say they've. They've at least had half a year of development before that trailer came out. So <laughs> my my math says around two years so far or some or so of development. Um if it's similar to the first game. May um, may I interrupt here? Uh, yeah, it's actually yeah, a little bit longer. Um they took about a two month hiatus after the launch of the first Hellblade. And they went right back to work. Yes, that's exactly. correct. And right. it, because oh, okay. Obviously, I mean, you cannot have a complete studio doing nothing for two years and pay their salary. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. So I've been in development and for quite only, some time. Uh, three and a half years now in the making today. Um, so, yeah. So, we'll, well, we'll really, talk about and, like, in, in, in being real here, how, how much of that time is working on that awesome ass trailer, though? Right. Because I know that, <laughs> that like, like, because when I say that, like, that God of War trailer that we saw took that team six months. That, that we saw at E3. Right. Yeah, well, but that was a demo. Um, that was not just a trailer. That was a playable demo. This one was an in-engine trailer. Um, yep. So what would that put that in terms of the timeline then? This is my is my uh, initial question. Because <laughs> the, the first game did take three years, and that means this is uh, this game has been already almost passing three years maybe uh in, in terms of development so I, I think that's a good amount of time but we know this game is a lot more ambitious we know that this game it was one of the first uh games or the studios i know of that has received the unreal engine 5 and a couple other things um but es essentially for for those who are wondering why she keeps donning the makeup in, in of senua and it's most likely due to scanning I know in the previous game, they really wanted to get the cracks of the paint on Senua's skin and the detail right. So they scanned her face and later modified it to fit the character Senua more. It's possible they're going back in the studio for that. Um, and essentially what they figured out was the makeup. This could also be it. Um, the makeup and the paint itself changes how the model can express herself when actually mocapping the expressions, which they uh, at least said was that was their developmental process on the previous game. But uh, yeah, I, I hope this game comes out this year. <laughs> this is one of my most anticipated games out there. I'm even more ecstatic because of the company growing even more in size due to Microsoft's ag acquisition of the company. And the first game only had 20 developers. Yeah, it's crazy. Playing. It's unbelievable. If you've ever played that game, it, look, I'll say this. Never judge a studio by its A. I, I think that is a lesson learned. And, and Ninja Theory, people consider them to be a AAA studio. I will as well. But if you look at exactly what 3Bit just said, folks, understand the skill set that this team must have had to have only 20 people. Folks, understand what I'm saying. 20 people made Hellblade 1. That's ridiculous. 
it's it's absolutely incredible <laughs> and it really shows that that studio they really know how to maximize the potential because you can really compare that to triple a games coming out in terms of the mocap in terms of the graphics and storytelling and now their team is is twice that which is 40 40 pe people working on the game now yes um so yeah incredible i i really hope the game comes out this year it's one of my most anticipated um but there there's a there is a lot of things to consider um archimedes made it <laughs> a great point I, I didn't know um to what extent of when they started the hellblade 2 uh development um but it, it's been in production longer than i thought so um i i'm thinking it, it's possible it, it could be out this year especially if you also think about the team size as 20 people and it took them three years and it's the fact that they were made able to optimize the game uh, the game is pretty short to be fair yeah. but they they were able to optimize the game to that level with with only that small of a team uh, is is it's incredible so we i mean we you could have a kojima like turnaround remember like they were infused with cash in four years they cranked out a game yeah you yeah. know and and and, uh, and you know bigger in scope and hellblade but like you, you it's possible for sure you, yeah. al you also don't know with Microsoft being uh, changing directions in regards to other teams helping other teams. You don't know if that, in fact, is what's going on as well. We don't that that's that's well, real, real inside baseball that we don't have information. Also, whenever they began the project, we don't know how many people were on board, you know, during, you know, was it you know, like when exactly did they start? How long was the planning stage? We don't know how many, you know, people were 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 working on each project because of course they came out with Bleeding Edge as well. And, you know, they have Project Mara. I think there's a, th a third project that they're also working on, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. we don't know how many people are in each of those, you know, projects. I'm sure they have certain people that are floating around depending on where they're needed at the time. Um, but Ninja Theory is also doing a lot of things at one time. They're super talented. Uh, I, I have no doubt that they're going to release a fantastic game, but that does take time. And, and, you know, once again, the whole COVID thing, we know, I'm not saying that that halted uh, production, but it definitely had to slow it down a bit. Yeah, there's no doubt. And I just, I just went to uh, their, uh, their, their um, LinkedIn page. Currently, there are 120 employees mm -hmm. at Ninja Theory. So if they have forty people, they've grown they, quite a lot. Yeah, they, they've gr they've grown absolutely significantly. But they uh, but they didn't have all those people at the start of the project, though. Wow, well, yeah, don't no, know. Uh, yeah, we don't know that if, though. We don't really know. And the thing is, of course, usually in a project uh, like this, um, in early in the early stage, not the full team is working on on the um, uh, on, on a game. Um, in the beginning, you have to do a lot of concept work. Yeah, How, what what is the idea for the game what do we want to achieve and so on and then you bring in uh during a later stage the actresses for mocap and uh, the sound engineers and the guys that, that actually create the assets yeah and so on um so of course uh the the further along you are in the project the more people you bring on on board however a three and a half year development time today is quite a lot for a small team yeah, it's not that uncommon to have a huge team um, working a lot longer. I mean, look at three for three. Yeah, until Halo Infinite will come out, they will have been it will have been six years. So, but for a small team, that is quite a long time, and there's no doubt that COVID slowed things down. And if COVID didn't happen, I would. It, and I, I stand by that statement. I bet that the plan was that Hellblade is a launch window game. Yeah, um, I there agree. is I a reason why they have shown that game along with the console. Um, it's been a long time in development, and if they wouldn't have been slowed down by COVID, I bet that game would have been out in the first six months uh, months of the console. Really? Um, yeah. So I'm like when I because when I'm thinking Hellblade from what I've like I've heard about it, um, like this is a this is a much more ambitious title than than you know hellblade one like when we're hearing that it, it's possibly open world or like hub world like and 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 much more cinematic than the original like i'm thinking that's a huge undertaking yeah, and it's like for my ignorance as well and then you have to build that team you have to teach that team you know I, there's a lot to go into it and again i don't oh, yeah. know ninja theory's turnout rate and yeah like 120 people but are they 
all working on that one project or are they like we got some up project Mara and then like a mystery title as well you know yeah well they they definitely not all the 120 people are working on hellblade we know about yeah. project mara um there are still probably one or two guys working on the support of bleeding edge and so on um there there yeah. is no doubt um but still um they have done the first game with 21 people uh, yeah, no uh, doubt. and and then they have a lot of more money resources manpower and time by the way we are they are already working six months longer on hellblade 2 than they did on the first one yeah okay. so i really don't know when it it comes out my i had an interesting discussion um with someone on twitter about this um and i have always placed a bet that this game will now come out this fall it will be a, a holiday game this this year however he did bring one thing to it to my attention that I didn't think of. And that is um, their intention of using the Unreal Engine 5. And 3-Bit um, said it, yeah, they are probably one of the first ones to get their hands on the engine. However, we have no idea how uh, COVID hit the development process of Unreal Engine 5. Right. So getting that engine delayed now, um, you know, it's kind of a ripple effect, yeah? Um, you delay the Unreal Engine 5, that means you have to delay um, um, Hellblade 2, and so it might get moved. I mean, consider this. A super small but highly talented team um, is working for more than four years this fall on the game. They started round about what we hear from in September, um it will it will be four years in september so um now let's think about this if it is a fall 22 game uh pardon me that would make it a five uh five and a, uh, a bit more than five year development cycle that's that seems just too long for such a small team um so i think if it's not gonna be a a holiday title this year it'll be a spring title um and it will be one of the first showcases for the unreal engine 5 there is no doubt about that yeah 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 and and that that's a fantastic point and again i'm glad you brought that up because september does in fact make four years that this game is an active development and again we don't know how big this game could logistically be four times bigger than the original a Hellblade one. I don't know that. They haven't confirmed on, on, on the size of it. And, and you bring up another great point about Hub Worlds. Maybe this is a God of War-esque type of design where it's not open world, but there are places to go on the map. You can, you know, you can travel to X, Y, and Z to go find secrets, to go find different weapons, to go find different armor. We don't know if this is going to turn into potentially, uh, you know, an RPG type of game. You know what I'm saying? Because obviously, you know, uh, as great as Senua's Saga was, it was very straightforward. Uh, but with that said, it looks as if they want to expand on the lore they want to expand on the enemies they want to expand on potentially how she plays as a character and what you can do with her uh bj let's get to you on this uh with hearing um with all of the the facts we have in front of us and again a lot of it is still fuzzy we don't have confirmation but i think i definitely in uh, in the camp with archimedes that this game will once september hits have four years worth of development you factor covid into it and whether or not that was difficult or not to uh, finish the process does this game hit holiday 2021 or are you like many others in the chat and on the panel thinking that this is potentially an early spring 2022 game um i think it's marginal boom and um Let's be honest, you know, that period is going to pretty much fly by, right, with the amount of games that are coming out. So I'm, I'm not really concerned about the release date, but um, the Hellplay 2 demo from 2019 obviously was was pretty impressive. And uh, in the words of uh, Dominic Matthews at Ninja Theory, uh, what we've seen so far is the art style, the tone and the mood of the game. Um, and I, listening to everybody, yes, it was made by a very small team since uh, Ninja Theory were tired of working with publishers and making ends meet. And we've heard this story so many times, especially with the studios that Microsoft gone out and acquired. So, so they embarked on methodologies, you know, almost like a throwback to the late 80s and early 90s. Um, 
you know, of a couple of people, you know, in the corner of a room playing with ideas until, you know, everyone else in the studio looks over their shoulder and sort of magnetically gravitated towards an idea. And then management hears about it and ultimately sought to take the risk and invest in it. And I, Obsidian's uh, methods and uh, their engine and what they're capable of is, is, is also, you know, what they obviously worked on in the background in creating Grounded. And that, that's one other title that comes to mind in terms of how these some of these studios that Microsoft have acquired actually think and work. I mean, I watched, just as you sent, kindly sent the notes over, Boom, I actually uh, spent a lot of time watching all the, uh, the developer diaries, development diaries, and a lot of the questions that are raised there are actually answered in there. Yeah, they are so good, yeah. And if you if you if you stop to listen and you actually pause the video, you can actually get a, a very good idea of the structure, the size, the scale, and the setup of the studio because it's so laid bare for you. And you just have to look; the knowledge is there. Just bend over and pick it up. I mean, Ninja Theory, what I understood, used, invented, used, and leveraged, you know, homemade or is it homebrew that people call it, cost-effective solutions, technologies, and methodologies to make a game that would have a a triple A feel to it. And would eventually need to sell 200, 300, or 500,000, or whatever the number was, via digital at $40 um, uh, in order to break even. I believe that the game went on to sell, what, a million units? And then only after 15 months or so, after the original release, it, did it actually see a physical release? I think we know that <clears throat> Ninja Theory is a 120 man studio, but and I, th I personally think that's a good size studio because we're all forgetting the fact that. If you look through the credits of all these AAA games you play, majority of their credits are related to third-party outsourced studios or companies that actually aid and abet, you know, the development of the game. So, 120-man studio is is not a gauge of how big or small uh, the studio is or the concept that's being conceived or, or the project that they're working on. It's just a guideline, and I think we need to be wary of that as well. But that's a very right. good point. Yeah. That's what? a very good point. I mean, the bigger the, the studio becomes, um, the bigger the overhead gets. Yeah. A lot more people will be just occupied to yeah. handle th things like building up the infrastructure in the office or handling the salaries and so on. Yeah, um, that that's just a fact. Um, it's a very good point, VJ. Absolutely. So uh, I didn't get to finish my point on Itakagi, so I'm definitely going to finish my my words my words on this topic. <laughs> so uh, uh, I mean, if you look at Ninja Theory, they're they're technically masterful. And, con and a conservative company and one that thinks like a publisher. And you only have to go back to its formation when it was founded uh, by its non-execs uh, non to have a finer and more valuable perspe perspective of, of, of what the founding uh, ethos is of that studio. And Xbox acquired them, I believe, as a safe pair of hands to provide content for them that would be respected. And, and I think that is the case. I mean, we, we, I mean, I know people may sort of point, start pointing out to Bleeding Edge uh, and so on and so forth, but as far as I'm concerned, that was a creative blip, an experiment to learn and grow from on Ninja Theory's resume. Every studio does it. Um, I think it took Ninja Theory nearly 20 years to release a, a critical hit that gave them recognition and not necessarily a commercial hit for, from a major publisher standpoint, at least, albeit the, you have to take into consideration the return on investment <clears throat> Uh, ratio in this case. And for me, Senua, Senua Saga perhaps can be defined as AAA. I'd rather have a dozen of those games than hope that my Avengers game will be hit big. Right? Yeah, Given I agree. They've made. And, <clears throat> and I think this is smart from Microsoft's perspective. If you want to talk about Ninja Theory, in terms of a triple, in the terms of the AAA space, as I call it, because it is quite broad, or terminology, then it, I think it should be in regards to invention, technical ingenuity, desire, confidence, focus, guile and grit, resourcefulness, and more, most or more, or most importantly, belief to beat the odds uh, um, and gaining success. And and that's what I found from watching all those videos. And in regards to Hellblade Two being a commercial hit, or one of the reasons that cements. Xbox as the und und undoubted or unparalleled place to play games. That, of course, remains to be seen. But what I feel many fail to realize, and I think it's the most unanimous and critical accomplishment that Ninja Theory has achieved amongst all of its critics or judges, entourage and supporters, is the fact that it's established itself as a place where the processes and personalities are so transparent, so laid bare in its YouTube development diaries that any talent, 
And and Freebit said this you know previously. There's so many talented directors, so many talented artists, coders, designers out there that if you are one of these guys, now all of a sudden, if you are a designer or a coder, and you will meaningfully meaningfully sort of consider the the Xbox Studios or this one in particular above all others, and because you see the management come out and present themselves in such a way that it's endearing. And and case in point. Um, I had a friend or a colleague, I can't name, but left Naughty Dog just most recently to join Ninja Theory recent times. And having said that, Senua Saga for me, and or Hellblade 2 is, is what the upcoming game is sort of being, you know, sort of called now, may well be an important piece of the puzzle in terms of what Xbox is partly or all about going into the future. Green lighting games like Senua Saga that are neither indie nor AAA. Uh, or uh, are for me experiences we may never have come to encounter and the game we're about to discuss, if not for Xbox and Game Pass, and, and it's been alluded to uh, by Ninja Theory, materially speaking, EA, Activision, Sony, and undoubtedly Nintendo may currently have the biggest commercial hitters out there. But I sense, uh, but and if anything, I think is obvious, Xbox are focusing on having an array, a, a varied lineup, an aggregation, or an amalgamation of different size games. That again makes, uh, for me, Xbox greater uh, than the sum of its parts. It's yeah. a winning strategy, uh, nonetheless, in my opinion. And it's just my opinion. No, BJ, I think you're onto something here, man. Uh, however, like, uh, yeah, go for it. Sorry. However, a lot of work remains. In fact, I would say it's only just begun. But if you ever want to go back and look at the journey of Xbox, you only have to go back and watch all of Boom's videos, right? And all, all the Xbox Factor podcast shows just sure. to sort of track the journey, so to speak. But I'll stop there because I think I might be putting Boom to sleep. No, no not no, at no. all. Dude, we, love, we, love, we love the path you're taking. Joe, why don't you yeah. finish it up for us? I think I think VJ is so on to something. It's like the sum of the parts because, like, yeah, look, look, as a PlayStation fan, I get to look, look at, like, you know, once, twice, three times a year, I get this blockbuster banger that comes out, and oh my god, it's amazing. We have this awesome conversation, blah, blah, blah. But then it kind of fades into obscurity after a few months, right? Um, when we talk about Nintendo, kind of the same thing there. We get a banger every maybe, maybe once a quarter, maybe two, three times a year. And, you know, they're huge, they're juggernauts. And when you take a look at Xbox, people are like, what do they have? And to me, I think it is Game Pass. I think it is the sum of what Game Pass offers where, you know, Jeff Keighley got a lot of shit for this when he was just like, yeah, no, I think that Game Pass is Netflix and PlayStation's HBO. And I totally agreed with that because honestly, when you take a look at right now, there's streaming services out there. And when we take a look at media, you take a look at Disney Plus and HBO, they have a big problem right now. These are more traditional based media outlets making that switch over to the digital content because they just don't have enough of it. They're, they're suffering from something from churn where you're done with the Mandalorian, which means you're done with Disney Plus, right? You're done with Euphoria, which means you're done with HBO uh, Max. Netflix doesn't have that. Netflix just this year was just like, we're, make, we're putting out a movie every week a new one every single week, a new original movie. And that gets people's heads turned. That gets people staying. Netflix has so much IP and so many shows, big, small, you know, blockbuster to indie, that you have a reason to stay there. That's exactly what Game Pass is. You have these big AAA bangers that you're going to look at. They're going to hit maybe three, four times a year, and it's going to be great, right? And then you have the small indie studios, right? Like, we're... Um, you know, you know, they're gonna get refreshed this uh, this month. Game Pass with a ton of awesome indies like Cyber Shadow coming in and and getting that recognition. There is so much content there that I think in the years to come, we're really going to see that dominance of Xbox switching to this this new style of cloud and streaming uh, uh, and, and just service based game uh you know game libraries that i i vj i i couldn't agree more at that point i thought it it was fantastic yeah and i think everyone's as really knocking it out the park uh this has been a fire show and and more importantly folks we have over we had over three, 350 people here uh and that's great the chat has been going so fast it's almost hard to keep up and that is because there's so, so much conversation going in on between the lines but um i do want to move on to of course 
topic number three, and we're going to keep Ninja Gaiden, um, Ninja Gaiden, Ninja Theory in the conversation. Uh, and, and why not? Uh, now, we do have new information on Project Mara, and it's a story and tech being used in this new horror title that's made exclusively for the Xbox Series X and S consoles. Now, thanks to a story that I pulled from comicbook.com, Ninja Theory shared their third episode of their Dreadnought Diaries video series, where the British developers focus on capturing reality in one of their upcoming titles, the one name that's codenamed Project Mara. Now, Ninja Theory's boss, Tamim Antonotis, revealed that Project Mara, announced in January of 2020, which of course is last year, is focusing on depicting mental terror and will be set in a single location in an apartment, though it's going to be recreated as perfectly as possible to the tiniest detail. Now, the game is set in one location, an apartment, and it's a real world location. And the art team's goal is to recreate the apartment perfectly to do this, we've, they said they first start with materials. They got a bunch of material samples from the apartment, wood, carpet, etc., wallpaper, and photographed them under lots of different lighting conditions. Then they scanned a bunch of them, a bunch of it, as well as using home-built scanners that our technical art director, Matt, created. With this reference... They then generated procedural shaders and detail maps to attempt to recreate the material as true to life as possible. Now, here are a few quotes from the article, and it says this. Project Mara is a very special project for us because although it's quite a concise project, we're attempting to do lots of things that we've never attempted before. And one of those things is to capture reality obsessively. The challenge for the artists is to create what we achieve on a micro scale with these materials, but across the whole entire apartment. And there's no way you can do this by hand. It has to be procedurally generated. So all of our environment artists dived into the procedural tools of and Houdini in particular and started to build and develop their own tools with sample interfaces so that we could scale these materials and features across the entire apartment. In closing, they say, so there's a kind of a shift going on with, within Ninja Theory in the way that we create art. Artists are not there just to create an object. They're there to create systems that could create that object and, in, and infinite variations of it. It's an entirely different approach that's laying the foundation for all of our projects across the studio and all of our future content. Joe, I want to go to you first on this because of what you said before we got to this topic. You had a hard time as uh, a gamer yeah. looking and trying to disseminate between what was real and what was fake. And if there was not a description telling you that, this tech is so beyond our unbelief understanding that I don't think that we could have picked the right one. What are your thoughts on what what they're doing for Project Mara? Honest to God. So I just like, I wanted to type it into like, like I, I literally had to, I'm like, is that, is that lady? <laughs> is that lady or person, whatever? <clears throat> is that person real? I literally had to like zoom in. I still like, I don't know. It could be, they could be, I don't know. And, that, and that's the freaky thing is like this, an engine shop of the stairs is so like, it's, it's getting there. We're getting there. Like it's so close to real. It's kind of scary. And, and like so much. So like the lighting, the lighting is almost normal. Like it's practically there. When you get to when you get to the stove, you could have flipped it of going in engine and real, like the the, the letters around it'd be like, yeah, no, that that that's that the, the in engine's real and the in you know the one that says in engine is definitely the fake one. And you would be fooled. This is nuts. And it, again, I like out of all the purchases, even Bethesda, I'll say it, Ninja Theories is the most exciting because they are a studio that we all know is incredibly talented, and they are now getting to finally be 
doing the things they want creatively, it seems, with just no barriers. And that's the thing that really excites me here. Because Bethesda, we know what we're going to get from Bethesda, right? You're going to get your 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 fallout. You're going to get your 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 uh, Elder Scrolls are great. And that's that's fantastic. When it comes to Ninja Theory, everything's a mystery, and that gets me way more excited. I agree. And yeah. yeah, like this definitely gives me some PT vibes. If you're stuck in an apartment, and this is going to be a horror scary game focusing on you know the, the the psyche that that's exciting like as a gamer like i'm excited to like i'm 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 only thinking of as well um like if only this game was in vr because i would strap my mother uh, to that vr headset and watch her scream of terror because i'm a good <laughs> son like that but like that this th- these projects as small as they may be these are the things that are exciting me the most with Xbox because you're seeing them publicly say, Hey devs out there, let's get weird and let's not be safe. Let's do something obscure as well. And so this, uh, this is awesome. But at the same exact time, I think we're living in a simulation. I mean, may be in the matrix. You, you might be yeah. onto something with that, but I, I want to go to Archimedes next and Archimedes. I want to go to you because you put out a video explaining this tech and of course it it had tremendous success so when you look at what ninja theory is doing not only are they pushing the boundaries or let let, let me rephrase that not only have they in the past pushed the boundaries with like hellblade we know that they're going to be pushing even further with hellblade to send you a saga but when you look at project mara and you look at the, the the mental terror that they're looking to tell. This is very reminiscent of what Joe has said early, their own version of PT, which is still renowned as one of the best games on the PlayStation 4 that never was a game, was just simply a demo. Uh, and it told uh, a very, very dark story in a very, very short corridor, whereas this game, from what we understand, is going to be an entire apartment. Now, what that mental terror is... We don't know. The tech that they're using, though, is impressive in a way that I think it moves gaming forward 10 years. And this is not a studio that's now exclusively making content for the Xbox brand. That is a big deal. What are your thoughts on the tech being used? Oh, um, yeah, like I said in my video, um, it is an exciting thing to see um, just how they approach um, their, their internal ways in how to create assets for, for their games. Um, I mean, even though the the development diary you are, you are referring to um, was about, um, uh, pardon me, now I'm blanking, <laughs> was about um, Project Mara. It is, um, the, the exciting thing is that this is not limited. They talk about that in the, in the video. Yes. Yep. Um, it is not limited to Project Mara. It is for them, uh, more to create their own tools um, to build super detailed assets. And I mean, um, that means they can use it for Hellblade, Hellblade 2. Um, they can use it for every other project they will be working on in the future. And that is what, what what is so exciting about this. And when you see or have a look at that tech, um, it is in, insane to how much detail they pay attention yeah they even talk about how they can create um little um debris from your skin little skin flakes on the ground hairs and stuff like that water drops in the sink and so on and that is is something that is is super exciting to see and it reminded me a lot about um the unreal engine 5 um demo we got um in in june last year um when they really talked about having assets um that that are um so detailed that you have basically information for every pixel um it, it kind of reminded me about that and we all know um ninja theory is using the unreal engine 5 so they might had that in mind already uh, when they created their own tech and to see that um development diary um gave me really goosebumps because um there, there was this one um, engineer uh, who sh- has shown um, and uh, demonstrated a little bit his own uh, build scanner for the materials. And that is something where I, as an engineer, say, 
um, kudos to you. I mean, if you don't have the tools available on the market to do what you want, build them on your own. Um, that's always what, what we do in the place I work. And um, to see them doing the same thing is, is really something awesome. Um, and now comes the, the big thing. We know that um, Xbox, um, as, as the Xbox organization, is really trying to get the studios working together to collaborate. That is what Sony has been doing so well over the last 10, 15 years. They get they they achieve that the studios work together, share technology, share their creative ideas. Um, and Xbox is really focusing on that right now. We can can see that across a lot of studios already. Yeah. Um, they just announced that the foliage that they used in the Hivebuster DLC yeah, is, is, for instance, used in, in Fable. Yeah, we correct. know that yeah. um, the, the water technology from Rare, from Sea of Thieves, has been shared with Playground games to be used in, in the uh, Forza Horizon games and so on. And now seeing this um, kind of technology where they really create these super detailed assets, these super detailed textures where you can really zoom in um uh and uh without the text just getting blurry and even if you zoom in closer yeah they they don't just put a um uh, a texture map on it they really make a 3d object out of every surface this is an incredible technology because it will enable ray tracing especially to work brilliantly in games and now they can share that across all the studios. And we know a lot of studios will work, use the um, Unreal Engine. Yeah? A lot of Xbox studios are working there. But just think about this, this kind of technology. They had a great idea. One guy had a great idea how to build a proper scanner for materials to create 3D surfaces on a, on a super low level and share that with masters of the Unreal Engine like the Coalition. Can you imagine how that will turn out? And this is what, what me, got me so excited about this. Is this is not just about us getting a super interesting looking game um, in Project Mara, but them seeing really um, investing in, in how they can um, create their own assets, their technology, how they can, they talked about that in, in, the, in the Dev Diary, how they will be able to share that within the studio um, for other projects as well. Yes. Um, and the same thing is goes, of course, to other studios. And that is what got me so excited. Yeah, I mean, listen, one, one, one of the things that uh, Archimedes and I have talked about this both privately and publicly, uh, either, either on our channels or through videos that he or I have done, it's the sharing technique that has, I'm, I'm sure it has happened before, but there's a more of a, of a pre uh, it being more important this time around with one team helping another team or sharing tech. And I think that with what Ninja Theory is doing, being there's such a small studio, it is incredible what they're going to be able to do with teams, big teams, let's say, for instance, like Playground Games, like 343, like Obsidian, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, the Coalition. Uh, and each one of these studios is going to be helping the other. And I think that in the years to come, we are going to see incredible, the, the realistic aspect of gaming that people have been asking for on the Xbox brand that we see almost on a yearly basis from Sony and their incredible studios is going to transition to many of the games we have coming. That's why something like Halo Infinite is going to be a real looker when it comes out later this year. I have, I have faith on that. Ne the next Gears is going to look incredible. Fable, Perfect Dark, all of these games that are these AAA monsters are going to are going to be better because of what Ninja Theory is doing. But before I get to um, uh, the next person on the panel, I do want to catch up on some of the super chats, and quite a few of them come in. First of all, King One Supreme drops an outstanding two dollar super chat and says Microsoft should drop games in quarter three, Hellblade in July. That's actually a great idea. I don't know if it would be ready for that, but listen, if they want, if it's ready and they want to release it, I'm all for it. We have RA 
89 drops a very generous five dollar super chat and says and it's so good and promising that devs like the coalition ninja theory and other great ones are going to start working together and share techniques indeed it is and of course our very good friend of the show jesse darby drops an outstanding five dollar super chat and says hi boom and panel welcome jesse i hope that you're doing well and of course listen if you are someone that are enjoying the show and you want to drop a super chat rest assured we will read it live on the air if you want to support double barrel gaming and become a channel member you can click that button right on the description aspect of this show and obviously with these super chats with these patreon supporters as well as the uh the channel membership it 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 allows not only for us to get new equipment to keep this show running which i got a new computer this year thanks to mrs boom but we also can do bigger and better giveaways and last year this small channel with only seven thousand people subscribed gave away over three thousand dollars of prizes which of course included a playstation 5 and an xbox series x and we are looking to obviously recreate that same magic this year but the only way we can do that obviously is through the generosity of the people that support this channel but listen um, I want to get to 3-Bit. 3-Bit, uh, you know, when you see the technology that's going on in Project Mara, quite frankly, it is, it, it, it's a bit of a conundrum when just looking at it because it is hard to disseminate one picture from the other. As a matter of fact, someone in the chat said, and I, I don't have their name in front of me, said that uh, they showed the uh, picture to their wife and they covered the description and the wife actually picked the procedural generated picture as being the real one if that kind of technology can come into fruition what we're going to get in project mara might be the most impressive piece of tech that we see whenever that game releases even this year again we don't know how big the project is but because it's not an open world type of game this is something that could easily be released this year what are your thoughts yeah, so I have a lot of thoughts about the the technology and and everything going on with the game. Um, starting with the Unreal Engine five, and, and then I'll I'll break down <laughs> into uh, the Ninja Theory tech. Um, so I always say that the showcase of the Unreal Engine five was was funny to me because it was it was really showing what the potential of the Xbox was, um, despite the game being shown on a PlayStation five kit. Um, because almost every major Sony studio uses their internal engines, right? They they don't use Unreal at Naughty Dog or Insomniac or, or Santa Monica. Yeah. Um, the only studio, Sony studio I can think of that might f- like fully take advantage of that uh, of the Unreal Engine is Ben Studio, which which creates Days Gone uh, because they they use the Unreal Engine. Um, Meanwhile, you have a ton of Microsoft Studios that shares tech with each other and and tons of studios that uses Unreal Engine, like uh, Archimedes was saying. Uh, Machine Games uses it, Gears of War, Obsidian titles, uh, like Grounded and Outer Worlds. Um, And the Nanite technology that they that is (laughs) going to be in the Unreal Engine 5 is incredible. And if anyone can take full advantage of the tech and and, uh, it's going to be great. and Ninja Theory, it is, it is it, it's going to be incredible. <laughs> Let's just say that. And it's able to use assets. Uh, the Nanite technology is able to use assets containing like billions of polygons without a single hit to performance. And this is what Ninja Theory will most likely be using for both Hellblade and Project Mara. And it, it actually cuts out a whole production pipeline of optimizing assets. So you can go straight from... Um, photogrammetry scanning and, and taking CAD data or even a ZBrush, ZBrush sculpt um, and bring it straight to the engine. So for people who don't knows who, who don't know what that is, it, it essentially is like when you're modeling a, a character or uh, like a rock in a game and you actually have to like optimize it and make sure it's able to be used in, in the actual game <laughs> because sometimes it's too much uh, detail. So you actually have to optimize it for a game. Unreal Engine 5 cuts that whole process out, um, which is just amazing. <laughs> you're, you're, you're taking film quality assets and being able to drop it into a video game. And the Lumen technology, which is uh, global illumination, making it so lighting is not pre-baked. You, 
when you turn on a flashlight in like a horror game and now has like infinite bounces, making lighting for horror games even more realistic. Um, so yeah, I, I have a lot to say on that, but the, the tech that Ninja Theory uses is fantastic. And, and even Digital Foundry, if you guys remember, uh, they were really confused on <laughs> how it was possible that the, the, the Hellblade 2 trailer was real time. Um, which yes, is, that is correct. Yep. It, it just goes to show you how great that technology is. And, and Ninja Theory is one of the few developers I know of that does scan out their environments. The The only other ones I can think of off the top of my head is, is Vanishing of Ethan Carter and Battlefront 2 um, for some of their environmental art. So um, not a lot of games are, are using this technology and, and we're really going to see the potential of it here. Um, and, and if any studio is going to hit the envelope of, uh, or push the envelope of what's possible, um, uh, Ninja Theory is, is that studio. <laughs> they, they, they did, um, amazing things with Heavenly Sword back on the PS3. The audio technology they're using in Hellblade is extremely immersive. It feels like I'm playing a VR game without a VR headset or, or, uh, <laughs> or without it even being first person. And the mocap they, they use for Senua is just incredible for such a small team size. And and on and they know with Project Mara, um, you know how, how they ripple off of Hellblade because of them using like they use like actual psychologists with that game and yes. suffer from a form of psychosis, which cause her to perceive the voices all around her. Right. So this game is that but um you know it's it's diff different story of course and, and all that but yeah uh, the technology in project mara is wow <laughs> yeah I, I have a lot to say on it but uh with, with, without me going into my game developer nerd nerd uh talk i, I think it's just gonna be great so yeah and, and i think again it's it's going to be a first for microsoft uh, in regards to um, a genre that a lot of people would shy away from. Um, and uh, I, I'm very excited. VJ, let's let's get your opinion on this. You know, this, this new tech that they're building is going to be revolutionary for the studio. But I think that who benefits for, from this, from this new discovery of, of, of making these scanners to bring like lifelike uh, art into its game is going to be Microsoft as a, as a company. All of the studios that are going to be looking to use this kind of tech in their upcoming games uh, in conjunction with, of course, Unreal Engine 5. W w again, the weight that people have been sitting back and waiting for Microsoft to deliver on seems to, like it's going to be over much sooner than later. What are your thoughts on what they're doing over there at Ninja Theory? Um. It kind of dovetails back into what we've already discussed, Boom, in terms of I think that the game has come about because of the structure of the studio and the kind of projects that they're conceiving. And I think that's why Project Mara exists. And, I mean, in general terms, I believe I've already sort of said what needs to be said about Ninja Theory, but it kind of has to, I have to dovetail back to the fact that it's a 120-man studio, which includes a combination of as developers, administration people, managers, producers, and let's take a let's take a stab at it and guess it's two small teams. It's it's the space construct and environment. And again, you can see this in the videos within which Ninja Theory feel most comfortable working in. And and the ideas and the projects and the conceivement of those ideas is born out of that structure. And it's a I feel it's a setup and a situation that Ninja Theory feel most creative in and has shown that works best for them. And rather than sort of the traditional large sprawling teams which have become so commonplace in a small team, um, you, and, and Freebit will attest to this. I, I, I hope, um, otherwise I look really stupid. Um, you, have, you have a voice, and more often than not, you are heard, acknowledged, and given leeway to break down um, the traditional thought processes and, and status quo. The way things are done. Sorry, it's just I'm just sort of tacking on to what Freebit was saying, and it's sort of given me, it's raised yeah. some suppressed memories within me. Sorry. So, so what what you're allowed to do in that environment is reinvent or invent new ways of doing things, whether it's using middle in a different way, whether it's writing their own tools, as as, um, as Archimedes alluded to, and and this is far more cerebrally and inwardly exciting for me personally. And, and I noticed a few people in the chat, the engineers and so on and so forth, also sort of mentioning this just now. They're continuing to talk about the previous topic, which is really was really interesting. And at the end of the day, it's human nature to be heard. And 
And then that made me realize that that's why so much talent um, and and, and uh, good talent is leaving are leaving sort of large studios and. And to sort of cement that point is why Idea Xbox announced it's launched over 2,000 indie games since its inception. And I think that Ninja Theory is almost like hit a sweet spot in terms of how studios should be structured. And it leans back into the point that you made at the beginning of the topic when you were talking about it, Boom, in terms of the sharing, not of just the knowledge and the creativity and, and tools and technical side of it. Because I'm not a very technical person, but in terms of structure. And um, and, I, and I think I'm, I'm sure Microsoft are looking at it and looking at how that's working for them and, and what the ROI on that is, you know, beside the, besides the conceivement of the project and how well that may fare within once it's released. In, in terms of Project Mara, I think the release date, again, is irre irrelevant for me. I just want to be kept surprised of it. But what is relevant is what I spoke of or what we spoke of last week. Um, Xbox will continue, I know we were saying this, hopefully share the journey of all 35 games, is it, that are in development that, that, we're, that we're thinking about or, or projects. Yeah. Of, of all the projects on an ongoing basis to keep the dream alive. And it's almost like they heard us and then, you know, released this for us just to talk about. So, and 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 continue to sell uh, future promise to those that are less focused or those that are on the periphery of purchasing an Xbox system, which I think there are many, uh, or even on the other side of the coin, subscribing to Game Pass, as, as Mr. Badbit alluded to in terms of, and, and you alluded to in your conversation about, look, Japan's moved on from a console-based uh, purchasing culture to playing games on tablets and phones and and then three bit mentioned about hey look you know what and they're also incorporating controls so that these games are accessible via your mobile device so and as Archimedes um, would say it's and he was saying this at the back end of last year it's great PR and maintaining presence uh, is critical for Xbox right now uh, since while they're trying to grow and establish um, themselves and more importantly the brand in a new generational fight or uh, and and I would say and, and I've been alluding to it for a while and we've kind of hit upon it new types of gamers F fans may say Xbox is established I would suggest if you ever get a chance to have a drink with Phil and, and ask him point blank if he feels that Xbox is well enough to, well enough established. And if he's honest and has real desire and ambition, he will say, yes, absolutely. But then he'll wink at you and sort of, in effect, giving you a non-verbal confirmation that he's not happy and he's only taking the first, first steps towards, I don't know, the Emerald City, so to speak. In, in terms of Project Mara, as I've said, it's, it's been clear to me and um, people that I know um, that Ninja Theory, first and foremost, is a technically led company. And you, and as I said, you only have to go back to its roots. And it took me back to my mind where if you're back in 20, 2004, um, I think it was Jez San, right, that bought them. And he was, what was his forte? You know, what, what was his claim to fame? It was the Nintendo FX chip. So you can understand, right, um, the, the foundation of the, of the business and, and why we're here where we are today, right? That, that, that ethos and methodology of creation and, and technical creation is, is still embedded within within the company. So let's be crystal clear. It's not – graphics are graphics, and I understand that, and they don't always sell games. And it's not really the color or the texture uh, from an image that sh impresses me. It's, it's not completely new to me. I've seen it in CG studios and so on and so forth. For me, it's all about the mystery and intrigue surrounding – a title like Project Mara, or even, um, and, it, and it actually took my mind to Anapura's uh, Anapurana's uh, interactive um, new game that's coming at 12 minutes uh, for, for that matter. I mean, for me, will it sparkle? Obviously, from the still renders, it seems it will, but you know, will it be a revolutionary plot? Um, how will it affect my uh, proclivity, so to speak? Will it leave us, you know, sort of hale and hearty, or pivot the nature of our minds? That, that's that's what I'm kind of looking forward to. I mean, I will admit there is a precocity, uh, I would should say, surrounding this game in terms of IQ, igniting your IQ brightness or an artistry or and a premise that seems to kindle and sharpen sort of one's um, um, awareness. In terms of Game Pass and its nihilistic critics, which, are, you know, there are abundance of, many, only, I would say to them, you only really want to see what you want to see, and there's very few that can see what's beyond Subject subjectivity for me is a, is a quality that's becoming a rare commodity in, com in critical and commercial thinking when coupled with emotion and attachment and, you know, all this tribal stuff. So as I said in my previous answer, what I see is that with Game Pass, with its future still being established, uh, green, light green lighting games like Project Mara, 
which are neither indie nor AAA games. We don't know what it is <laughs> right now. And that's the intrigue. And that's the excitement about it. But potentially, it could be a sparkling experience, but not at all possible to experience uh, or sort of, um, you know, available if if Xbox didn't green light it. And, it's, uh, and, it, and it could be a very strong um, byproduct of what the what the Game Pass subscription model is all about. And I think that's what's really interesting and important and uh, sort of calms me down when I see the Game Pass, you know, everyone talking about, I was just going to have fodder, cheap games and so on and so forth. No, I, I think it's opening up avenues for, for incredible amounts of creativity and intrigue. Again, as I said last week, um, a couple of games from Xbox's internal studios could potentially be genre defined. That's what I said last week. And yeah, perhaps, yeah, you're right. And perhaps Project Mara is a potential candidate uh, once, once we know more. Well, I mean, look, what, what, you're, what you're saying, it makes a lot of sense. And I think the, 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 uh, the model that Microsoft is looking to do is opening the doors for studios to take risks. Uh, kn knowing Ninja Theory as being a very technically led and sound studio, using what they're going to be doing, not just only in Project Mara, which obviously is groundbreaking tech, but what they're going to be doing in Hellblade, I'm, and I believe that you're going to see a lot of crossover between the games in, w w when talking about the tech. Xbox fans have a lot to look, up, look forward to from this studio. What I, excites me personally is where they're going to go and how they're going to help other studios reach goals that they may not be able to have gotten when it comes to photorealistic graphics. Now, Zemi, I saved you for last because this is a game that you're probably <clears throat> not going to play. Uh, and yes. that's fine, uh, because obviously you, you call yourself a coward. I disagree. I think that you did very well in the times that we were playing <laughs> um, uh, horror games together. But this is a big deal. This is a big deal for Microsoft. This is an even bigger deal for Ninja Theory and, and the, the potential for what Project Mara could be. Um, and uh, is it very exciting for you personally when you cannot tell a picture from the real thing mm -hmm. when you take side by side tells me that they're on to something special. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So, you know, like the funny thing is about buying, you know, new consoles and new generations coming out is, you know, uh, uh, you know, of course, you know, there, there is that group of gamers who, who want, you know, massive changes in gameplay and how games are actually played. But for a lot of people, I feel that they want improved graphics, right? And, 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 and in some ways, like this is kind of like secretly what all of us console gamers have always wanted was just super realistic games, you know, the ultimate immersion, if you will. And I think that that's really what Project Mara is coming close to, right? You know, it's one thing to say, um, you know, the Xbox Series X is going to have 4K. It's going to have ray tracing. It's going to have, you know, better graphics, all this different stuff, right? It's one thing to talk about it, but it's a totally different thing and seeing it, right? And whenever you see these screenshots from Project Mara and, and, and you are having such a hard time distincting, you know, like what is real from what is not, you know, um, kind of like the simulation effect that Badbit was referring to earlier in this topic. You know, it, 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 it's just impressive, right? And, and I think one of the biggest things, uh, one of the pos most positive things that comes out from Xbox having the ability to call Project Mara their game, a first party game, is that people are going to see that. And even if they're not interested in playing Project Mara specifically, they're going to see that and and that might be the thing that convinces them to buy an Xbox above a PlayStation or to buy an Xbox instead of, you know, spending $2000 for a PC. Correct, and, great point. You know, just because once again, they may not be interested in Project Mara, they may be like me, they may be a coward, they may not like horror games and getting scared and having heart attacks and all that different stuff, right? <laughs> but they're going to see that and they're going to know that that is what to expect from the Xbox brand, from from gaming on Xbox, that is what you get. And of course, PlayStation may be able to, you know, to match that value, but Xbox is doing it first. They're going to be the ones that are going to be able to show you those screenshots, show you that gameplay live on their consoles first. And, and I think from, you know, a marketing and promotion perspective, that is super, super 
strong for Xbox to boast and be able to say that they have. And I think it can drive huge traffic over to Xbox um, other than, you know, having people go and get a PC, having people go and get a PlayStation. That is a huge convincing, you know, image, you know, just looking at how realistic and how meticulously, you know, laid out, you know, the the the. the those environments in that game are it, it's it's just impressive and i think it's impressive enough to push a lot of people to go to team xbox so that they can experience project mara or something like project mara um and, and, and i mean that's that's basically ultimately you know my ideas for project mara i i am absolutely so upset that I am a coward because, uh, and, and, and I feel the same way about um, the medium, right? The medium looks incredible. I would actually say that Project Mara looks a lot more impressive than the medium, but that's not to say that the medium doesn't look great. The medium, in my opinion, is one of the most next gen looking games that we that 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 we have coming out so far, and it kills me that I can't play it. Uh, because I don't like being scared. And it kills me that I won't be able to play Project Mara because the same reason, right? But I cannot wait until I can get those experiences and, you know, the genre of games that I can play. Um, but it, it just, it's impressive, the technology and how it's evolved. And 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, like, what do you say about it? You know, um, it's it's just impressive. And, and you know what? And, and rightfully so. It's something to certainly get excited about. Now, folks, listen, uh, I just have to make sure uh, I don't mind going into overtime because we do have an, we have a, do, a stalker to topic. But I want to make sure that everybody here on the panel can hang around for an additional 15, 20 minutes panel. Can you guys hang around? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So what I don't know how much I could add to it, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. well, you know what? We're going into overtime, folks, and hopefully you do appreciate it enough that you uh, hit the like button because, obviously, I wrote this show with four topics with the ideology that we were going to be 30 minutes. But, again, the way I run my shows, no one has a time limit, and I think it's better – run that way. I love hearing everyone's uh, complete points where they don't feel like they're strapped for time. So guess what, folks? We are going into overtime and we're going to be talking about Stalker 2. Now, this is a game that many people in the community, many people in the gaming media are considering the dark horse of the games that are going to be exclusive for the Xbox Series X and S. And, you know, they recently, and I say they, GSC Game World, who is developing this game, just recently uh, dropped a teaser trailer for Stalker 2. And I got to be honest with you, it was creepy. It was scary. It did not show much, but the graphics were to die for. Now, the studio has just announced its long-awaited sequel will come to Xbox Game Pass on day one. That's right, day of launch, and will feature both ray tracing technology and 4K resolution support, possibly making it the best-looking game on the platform. Additionally, the studio has detailed the current production progress of the game, and here is what they had to say. We are progressing smoothly, including the Xbox X, the Xbox Series X and S versions as well. The aim is to deliver the product of the highest quality possible on every platform it's announced. With fast SSD, RTX support both on the Xbox Series X and S and 4K resolution on the Series X, we are pleased to see how Stalker 2 is shaping up to be the ultimate experience we've initially promised you. Now, based on the in-engine trailer released in December last year, it seemed pretty much guaranteed that Stalker would be pushing the graphical envelope. It's nice to now know that we have a guarantee that ray tracing will be available on all formats and 4K on both PC and the Xbox Series X. Now, finally, we have learned that Stalker 2's protagonist has a code name of Skiff. While nothing further is revealed about the character Skiff, C a GSC promises that his actions will shape a new grand chapter in the history of the zone. Now, I'm going to say this. After watching the trailer multiple times, folks, I walked away 
extremely impressed and got a very Metro 2033 vibe as well as a Resident Evil 7 feeling of dread just from the minute and a half preview trailer they dropped last week. And I will say this, being that Stalker 2 is an Xbox Series S and X exclusive, the fact that it appears to be pushing the graphical fidelity on both these consoles to its limits has me even more excited for the sequel of a game that I never played. So I never played Stalker 1, but I've heard magnificent things. Stalker 2 seems like it's going to be a very, very deep, dark dread type of game. And I know, again, Zemi will probably not play it, but maybe he will if someone gives him a big gun. Now, the question that I have for the panel, and we'll start with Zemi. We're going to go right back to you. Stalker 2, the trailer dropped. It is, it is, it's horrifying. And it's only a minute and a half. But man, it showed graphics that if those are what we're getting on our Series X and S, Xbox gamers have a lot to get excited about. What are your thoughts on the trailer? Uh, I thought that the trailer looked absolutely fantastic, wonderful. Uh, I don't know what it sounded like because the sound was off on my headset, but um, I, I thought I thought it looked great. I, you know, seeing uh, like the the wind effects and 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 seeing how the tree was coming down. I, I just like I, I really thought it looked uh, next gen for sure. Um, you're 100 percent right in saying that I uh, probably won't play it. I, I definitely won't play it unless it's co-op, and I, I I don't know what to expect for that. Um, if it is, I will play it. If it's not, then no, there's no way. Um, I I 100 percent agree with you with the Metro vibes for sure. Um, you know, and, and funny enough, Metro was one of those games that I've always wanted to play. <laughs> And um and and I've never played it because uh, of of just like the creepy vibes and 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 um just yeah I I've just never played that so um it definitely looks like a game that I would for sure want to play kind of like Project Mara kind of like the medium uh, but I'm just not going to uh, ultimately play because I am a coward. Um, I'm not really sure what to say beyond that. I haven't ever played, you know, the previous Stalker game. I, I, you know, I don't know if it's any good. A lot of people seem to love it. So I would imagine it's, you know, pretty darn good. But I, I think it's great that they are coming out and, you know, giving us the information, confirming the graphical specs and, and the features to expect from this game. Because still with a lot of games, it's kind of up in the air. Like, is it going to be 30 frames? Is it going to be 60 frames? You know, is it going to, you know, have 4K textures, you know, on launch? Or is it going to have ray tracing on launch? You know, a lot of that type of stuff is still up in the air so it's great that you know uh we got the teaser trailer and it's great that they you know confirmed some of the graphical specs and features to expect from the game yeah and and, and i and i like that they went into specific detail mm -hmm. um uh, but real quick before we move on to the next panel member to uh finish off this incredible show we have to think a new channel member john b generous friend of the show is now a channel member for Double Barrel Gaming. Thank you for that, John. Super appreciate it. And we also had um, RA89 drop an additional outstanding $2 super chat and says, what if Xbox shifts to developing ID tech? I, I, would, Im I would imagine that that could in be incorporated into uh, many of their upcoming games because now they own that tech. Uh, so that is a definite possibility. Uh, but let's, let's go over to Mr. Badbit. Mr. Badbit, look, you have heard the cries of the people. Uh, people want realistic looking graphics. Uh, yeah. We're getting that with Hellblade. We're going to get that with Fable. We're probably going to get that with Perfect Dark. But it's the smaller games from the smaller type developers like um, uh, CGS uh, Studios, a, a, a game world that is bringing us Stalker 2. Now, this is a new game to the Xbox franchise, but quite frankly, in tow seems like it's going to be a graphical masterpiece. Uh, we don't know what the game is going to play like. It's obviously in first person, but what are your thoughts on the trailer? Uh, you know, it looks so good that I was like, this is CGI, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's one of those. Um, I, dude, it looks cool. I, I'm, I've never played Stalker. So, like, I, I personally, when people are freaking out, I'm like, cool. Uh, and yeah, since this is, I, I believe it's going to be on Game Pass, right? Yes, day um, one. Day one for yeah. Game Pass. Yeah, definitely try it out for sure. At least give it a shot. Because again, it looks 
absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, uh, that's really that's all I got. No, but, I mean that's fine. That's fine. You you, I, you killed it on the other topics for sure. The one, the one thing that I'll say here though, the one thing that I think I'm getting the most excited for in terms of like the next gen stuff is look how good fire looks now. Yes. Like when I was playing Demon Souls, I was like, this fire looks dope. This now as well, like looks looks like an actual flame. Like we're getting there, boys. It, we're we're getting to the to the to the uncanny valley sooner than we think and it's it's wild yeah so, and yeah. And, it's, and it's a great a great ride to be on archimedes let's get your opinion on this uh again there's not much to go on but there is enough that if you are someone who is into graphics who wants to see what next gen looks like i think it's safe to say that stalker 2 is going to deliver what are your thoughts bro oh i'm super excited i played the original stalker um <laughs> uh including all the the add-ons and um or extensions uh i love the series and we can thank gsc game world for uh for this incredible series because um basically they uh, the the founders of the studio left and um built the metro um and the metro series is incredible um it's one of my favorite um series uh, from the last generation um a previous generation and um the games are just amazing and um if you don't know what stalker is think metro but a little bit more open world with um more dialogue choices where you where your decisions actually matter um and this is their like they said in the in their development blog um their most ambitious project i mean every developer says that uh, about their new game man so so this stalker was like or or metro is kind of like the like the spiritual successor exactly Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was giving me a bit, a bit of that vibe as well. Okay, that's really interesting. But yeah, totally, like, this is a different team taking on. This yeah, that's now map. a different team. Uh, I don't know how many of the original folks are still there. Um, nevertheless, um, it is a a great um, a great franchise. Um, it has a lot of potential. I really enjoyed. Um, it's not an RPG, yeah, you know, uh, but you still can make decisions uh, in the story, and that is, this is really an interesting take. And um, I mean, we got that little CGI teaser trailer during the July event from from, from Xbox last year, yeah. And now they have shown a they called it a gameplay teaser, so it must have been at least in engine. Um, if not really actual gameplay footage, um, maybe uh, sequences or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. But since I didn't see a real difference, to be honest, in between the CGI trailer that they have shown last year and that gameplay teaser now, I think we are in here for a real looker. It has been confirmed 4K ray tracing. I'm also hoping for a performance mode. Um, this is going to be a real sleeper hit. Um, it, 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 I don't know how, about you if you enjoyed the Metro series, but if you, I loved it, uh, then you will love Stalker. This is your game, and this is not a small game. It will be technically ambitious. It will be on a huge scale, um, and just because the studio isn't or so well known in the console space because the pc game yeah, yeah. in mm-hmm. the pc space stalker is, was huge yeah it, it was a huge franchise it was a beloved franchise so it's not it's not uh, a small secret hit it is just for the console gamers not that they are not that familiar with that franchise but it's it's definitely a sleeper hit and i'm super excited for it I'll say this, uh, the the synopsis for Stalker 1, it says it's a series of first-person shooter survival horror, which is interesting. Um, And uh, it takes place um, in Chernobyl after a second uh, nuclear power plant uh, explosion. And obviously, there's going to probably be some supernatural-related stuff involved. If you think after the first one, you'd be like, maybe you should put like some safety precautions around these. No, nah, well, it wouldn't make a good video game if you did. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but if you the, ever played a video game with good safety precautions, that would be not a good game. It'd be a boring game. Like, I, I guess it's like pick another place, but Ch- like Chernobyl's been through a lot. You know what I mean? Where's one guy in a hard hat going? You know what? Maybe we make some safety nets. I don't know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Three bit. Let's get your opinion on this now. Listen. Yeah. At, at some point in um, a, a little game called Fear, 
that was exclusively on a P on the PC and it saw great success on the Xbox 360. Uh, and I believe that with what we've seen so far, with the storied history of Stalker One, now the follow-up to one of the, one of the best-selling PC games according to Wikipedia, uh, we could get a like like um, uh, uh, Archimedes was just saying a sleeper hit. Uh, what what are your thoughts on the trailer? Uh, and I really liked it, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I I think if it's if people do like the Metro games. Uh, like uh, Archimedes was saying, um, the Metro was created by X members of Stalker, and and, and the games are, are similar, but the games are pretty different. The Metro games are very linear in its level design and in storytelling, while the Stalker games are, are a lot more open and could be compared to something like Fallout and its loneliness. <laughs> it's just like very. Uh, uh, it could be scarier in that way where you don't really know what's going to happen, um, especially when replaying it. Right. But yeah, the, the immersion and, and the universe within those games and, and uh, how you deal with uh, just things in the apocalypse, I guess is very creepy to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited for, for the game. I, I think stalker is, is the series where uh a lot of fans have been waiting for the game to come out. They didn't, didn't wasn't sure if it would, and, and then they had that announcement trailer a uh, 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 a couple months ago, and and so yeah, I'm I'm really excited for the game. I, I think uh, if it's anything like the first game, but just better, <laughs> better looking, and which it looks incredible. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really excited for the game. Yeah, I mean, and, and and what's interesting, and I, I love how uh, they give us a breakdown of what we're getting graphically, how this game is going to play, how it's going to look from the obviously from the trailer. But I love the fact that immediately, yeah, this is a day one in Game Pass, and like I said, this is a game that maybe if you didn't hear about it, you might just overlook it. Stalker Two, what's that? I, it's an Xbox exclusive. We don't know, whatever, and they keep moving. Yeah, but maybe it'll help out Zemi. Uh, the fact that it's more of a free roam type game if, if you did play the old stalker games like archimedes was saying it, it is more free roam than than metro so that, make, that makes it worse because then like oh, okay. a, like <laughs> anything could like pop out and scare me true true <laughs> <laughs> all right well let, let's get uh let's get um um vj's final opinion and we'll get everyone out of here of course i want to thank everybody that tuned in and hang and obviously you're hanging around for the the uh the bonus footage if you will uh for you, uh, VJ, wh where where does Stalker Two go on your list? Obviously, it they're pushing the boundaries with graphics. We know that it comes from a very historic Stalker One that was very popular and still is popular on the PC, but now it's coming home to consoles, more specifically to the Xbox platform as an exclusive and in Game Pass. What do you, what are your thoughts? Um, so my my initial thought is. Uh, why does it feel like today's show is leaning towards all the games Zemi won't be playing? <laughs> so, right, right. Am I right? Yeah, that should be the I title guess. of the show. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I have to take the liberty of opposing just a couple of views here, so I apologize in advance. Um, the, the trailer does show what the Xbox Series S and X are capable of today. In 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 the hardware's infancy, it most definitely does not show what the Xbox Series S and X are capable of long term. And I just point to um, three bits point about Nanite and Lumin being employed and utilized uh, via the UE5 engine in hopefully not too distant future. It does, however, showcase and present, because I did have a look at Stalker um, on, on YouTube and obviously comparing it to the trailer. And it is quite visibly obvious that the studio uh, based in Ukraine, if you didn't know Kiev, has, um, has matured and evolved as a developer over the years. It's, it's pretty obvious. Um, they've certainly seen and gone through the rigmarole and pantomime of, um, how can I say, being a modest-sized developer, then becoming a large developer. And it seems right now they're at a healthy size that they can manage 
uh, and, and afford to run. It's also important to note, which was uh, quite surprising to me, and it was just by chance that I came across it, that they're actually using Unreal 4 or, or 4.25, and it's a departure and a withdrawal, uh, if not probably a realization that has occurred within the studio in terms of, as I said, the pantomime that they've gone through that uh, sees, this, sees the Ukrainian developer um, shelving the, their in-house tech for something that is uh, more widely recognizable. And I would say, uh, Boom, that that's probably wise to use established tools, as does Ninja Theory and 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 uh, the many other studios that 3Bit um, alluded to that are pretty fluent um, with uh, with the engine. And, um, and, it, and I say that because it's very easy to leverage um, support from the community and the community is fantastic for the Unreal Engine, and, and it always has been. And solutions to problems um, are key. Uh, sorry, are key, but they're they're sort of like a few key strokes away uh, on occasion, unless you're focusing, as our communities would tell you, on something which is something very unique and specific tool which has to be built in, in house and bolted onto the main engine. Um, in, in let's be truthful here, <laughs> except to the eye of love, a large number or even one game or another pretty much sort of falls into a similar category or, or experience uh, as does another. After watching the, the, the Stalker 2 trailer, some quarters would have you believe the game, uh, that one game, you know, this you know, this particular game is a marvel and others have, have sort of read in the comments sort of vote to declare the game as being total ass. But Stalker 2 for me was attractively ugly and some may despair it despair at it while others are enthralled it just seems to have that vibe to it uh, i mean it had a spectacle a shiver and a vibration uh, that it provided me and and at one point i was thinking oh my goodness i wish i could just expunge the whole experience because i don't really like the horror genre that much but yet I, I at the same time there was an intrigue and yearning to learn play and know more and knowing that it's going into game pass I, I, it's, it's, it's inevitable that 99 percent, even zemi even they won't admit it will try the game uh, and I'm a f- no, I won't. <laughs> no, just, just don't hold your breath. I'm afraid. That's all I'm going to say. Of, um, yeah, I'm. Um, th- I mean, the question will become more and more commonplace: Is Stalker Two or any other game for that matter going into Game Pass because Xbox has pulled off a, a coup d'état or, or, or a master stroke, or is this the remnant of a situation that has led to a, a sort of matrimony alliance? When you realize the harsh realities of the marketplace and uh, just looking at how quickly games are sort of coming down in price in the US, which it never used to happen. I mean, in Europe, I'm pretty used to it. Um, but anyway, that aside, while I appreciate the trailer, it, it didn't sort of evoke illicit or, uh, or kindle any sort of sort of uh, longing or desire for me to play the game, you know, straight off the bat, you know, while I'm waiting with bated breath for the door to pop through the letterbox like they used to do in the back back in the good old days. But um, and, and and I think one of the reasons is I've been playing so many games in Game Pass, and uh, I don't know when I'm going to catch catch up. But competition um, in this present era of gaming uh, and this specific time is very stiff at the moment, shall we say? But um, I, got, I got a question. Uh, what you just said, BJ, has me has me curious. Uh, and this one actually goes to Zemi. Zemi, what are you doing 5 p.m.? You want to watch a Resident Evil showcase with me, buddy? <laughs> no. Now I'm he wouldn't good. watch it. He wouldn't. He, 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 I mean, I mean, if you really you. need somebody to be there, I could be there. But oh, I mean, screen. I would have a pillow. My sound would be down. I wouldn't hear anything that you're saying. You want to watch a small marathon, Zem? Just no. Sorry, just to, I just <laughs> wanted to say. Sorry, I just wanted to say. I do wish the studio and Stalker Two the best of luck, and I'll definitely be be playing it, um, just to give them support. And obviously, you know, it's it's part of how they generate revenue right through the Game Pass um, um, publishing structure. So, so yeah, I think uh, even if you can play it blindfolded, Zemi, that would definitely, and and maybe with the sound off, um, would definitely attribute to attribute to the treasury of uh, of the of uh, Game World. Well, look, the one thing, it's funny because I didn't even think of it. When looking at the show, Zemi's not playing half the games here, so which is is is, mm-hmm. is funny. It's funny, but also concerning because he's going to miss out on a, a tremendous amount of uh, conversation when these games finally release. Maybe, maybe he'll play. You know, he'll just keep the sound down or shut it off. Listen, folks, this has been an absolutely fantastic and stellar 
uh, show. Uh, again, obviously, we went into overtime. I hope that you guys and gals obviously enjoyed the extra banter. Uh, when we write these shows, I'm going to be honest with you. I am now doing four shows a week. And to be honest, uh, m- my favorite place to be and one of my favorite shows is the Xbox Factor podcast. One, because of this, a, a stellar panel. Of, of gentlemen, but more importantly, the Xbox is my uh, console of choice. Sure, I support everything, but I love the Xbox brand, and I'm so happy that I do have an audience that enjoys it enough to tune in each and every week. Uh, we had almost 300, we had over 350 people here today. That, that's great. That's great. Of course, we'd love to have 750 people here, but we're going to keep growing the channel, and I think that as the year progresses, when we start getting into now E3, and a few of these other shows, the audience will once again tune in when there's some major breaking news. But listen, folks, if you enjoy today's show, I do encourage you to please hit the like button. If you are someone new to the channel and you enjoy the banter, you enjoy uh, enjoy the safe space, thanks to uh, mo- a multitude of moderators, but the lead, the, the sheriff... Uh, Lito Papa, keeping it safe and fun for everyone, is uh, the gentleman that walks silently and carries a big stick. And he will ban you. And he has full authority to do so. And he does that to uh, perfection. Uh, but, of course, let me get to the outros. I'm going to start with Zemi Games. Zemi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for telling everyone that you won't play any of these games because yep. you're a coward, which I disagree uh, yes. with. Yeah, I disagree with. Tell everyone about your new foray into gaming with the constant gamer website tell them about the obviously two quizzes that are up and where could people reach out to you for a conversation yeah so absolutely so uh the main thing that i'm doing right now guys is um building up a website called constantgamer.com uh it's a gaming news and and review website um that uh pretty much the overall idea is to try to be more objective than subjective stick to the facts and 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 not be like uh plenty of other gaming media websites which is just completely unbiased um uh, but in addition to, you know, gaming news and stuff like that, uh, we also have a community section of the website that's going to, you know, grow as time goes on. And currently we have two quizzes on there, one that I wrote, one that Boom wrote. Uh, I wrote an Elder Scrolls quiz, Boom wrote a Resident Evil quiz. They're both absolutely fun. And if you have not played them, I definitely recommend dropping by the site. Once again, it's constantgamer.com and checking it out. And even though I don't play scary games, we we do have, uh, you know, a, a handful of writers uh, now. And uh, I know of one that's going to be doing a review for the medium. So even though I don't play scary games, we're still going to be covering that on the site. I just won't be writing about any of it. Um, And then, of course, we're also still looking for writers. So if any of you guys are interested in writing for the constant gamer dot com, just go to the website um, where the contact uh, us is at. Just click on that then click on join the team and you can fill out a short little application to uh, to join the writing team for the site. And then to check out our YouTube or Twitter, all of our social medias uh, up in the top right hand corner is uh, buttons to do all of that on the website as well. Uh, and yeah, boom, this show was amazing. There wasn't a tremendous uh, you know amount of things I could talk about. Um, I, I you know tried to, you know, I guess maybe steer it in a different way, like more of like a marketing, you know, idea or just like like an overall idea of how this is going to affect Xbox, because I'm not going to be playing a lot of these games. But the show is still fun nonetheless, man. Well, listen, dude, it's always great to have you a part of the show. And obviously uh, you do you do bring a, a lot of um, hilarity, if you will, especially when you start talking about how you're not going to play these games. But listen, mm-hmm. at least you're honest. Uh, let's go to next to, of course, our good friend on loan from PlayStation Nation. Uh, Joe, you have something coming up at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Trophy Room. And we do know that, of course, PlayStation does have the marketing rights for Capcom's upcoming Resident Evil The Village. We should be getting some new screenshots, some gameplay for sure. More importantly, we're all hoping for a confirmed release date, which I believe is going to be in the next month or so. I, they, they, they love that February, March month, so we could be getting it much sooner. Tell everyone about the outstanding trophy room, and more importantly, where could people reach out to you for a conversation? Yeah, so first and foremost, I'll say it. Zemi's a coward, and he needs to start playing. He, he yep. needs to start <laughs> it up. You know, this is it. Nope. You got to do it. You got to do it. Nope. You know? Nope. Do it for the vine. Rip vine. Uh, you can find me over at, first and foremost, great show as always. Uh, you can find me over at Mr. Bad Bit 
uh, on Twitter. You can find the Trophy Room Podcast on YouTube whenever YouTube wants to not hide all my content. Uh, or, you know what, better yet, where the show really kicks a whole lot of butt at, go to Apple Podcasts. Go to Spotify. Spotify's been crazy good to us. Uh, go to anywhere you find your podcast. You can find the Trophy Room there. And, yes, we are doing a stream. It's our last stream for our good friend, uh, Bobby Paul, the Nintendo guru who is fighting COVID-19. Hopefully there's some good news in the coming days about that. We have raised over 20000 thousand doll hairs uh we are trying to raise even more for his hospital uh bills he's been that's, in great, the that's fantastic since halloween yeah we need to do as much as we can because when he gets out those bills man they're gonna they're gonna be big so we gotta help him in a big way uh so you can find my stream over at twitch.tv slash ps trophy room if you miss out on our reactions that will be on youtube uh shortly afterwards and we'll be doing a bonus episode of the show um that will be up maybe i think tonight or tomorrow morning so be on the lookout for that man uh all the love to the show has been fantastic and a lot of i see a lot of uh this community uh trickling on over so thank you all so much for giving us a chance here so yeah i love you all so very much you know wear mask social distance because yes. you don't want to be like me and forget everything it's scary <laughs> yeah don't, well def- definitely do that and again, again it's great to have you back Red, glad that you and the family are doing well and uh, definitely appreciate what you bring to this show each and every week. And, of course, uh, Archimedes, why don't you tell everyone about where they could reach out to you on social media. But more importantly, check out and add to the uh, the running total of your two back-to-back bomb videos this week. Yeah, first of all, thanks again for having me on the show. It's Always a pleasure being here. It's one of my highlights. Uh, as soon as the week starts, I'm looking forward to Thursday to talk games with my buddies from the other side of the world. It's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, you can find me at Boxenberger basically everywhere. Twitter, uh, Xbox Live, PlayStation uh, Network, and of course here on YouTube, where I have a small YouTube channel that covers not the daily news, but more of certain topics about the gaming industry. I uploaded two videos this week, which I rarely do, but there were two things I really wanted to talk about. The first being, of course, the new technology that has been introduced from Ninja Theory um, that went up and <laughs> was, is, is my best performing video ever. Um, and the second video that I, that I uploaded this week was about a performance upgrade that uh, is available to the dev kits uh, for the Xbox. Um, so if you're into these kind of videos, definitely check my channel out. And yeah, thanks again, Boom, for having me on the show. Yeah, it's great to have you on, as always, and congr- congratulations once again. Uh, 3-Bit, you have a YouTube channel that I think is growing rapidly. Also, tell everyone about where they could reach out to you and strike up a conversation on social media. For sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's, it's always a pleasure being on the cast with all of you guys. Um, you guys can find me on Twitter. It's at the VGHD. And my YouTube channel is The Video Games HD. Uh, I'll be pretty busy this week. I'm doing uh, some internal work at my production studio, but I'll be still trying to podcast with Boom and other peeps in the community. So uh, thanks to the panel again for the awesome topics in this bonus show. And the, the chat was very supportive and lively. So make sure you guys hit the like on the way out. And we'll see you guys on the next episode. Definitely appreciate that, brother. Thank you so much. And last and no way least, uh, one of the most detailed Uh, panel members who brings his opinion and i think that we are better for it especially because his vocabulary is out of this world vj tell everyone but where they can reach out to you strike up a conversation and more importantly what are the shows you're guesting on thanks boom um i just want to say thank you to the community in the chat today for all the support and nice comments um i'll continue to do my best for the show that gave me my first break into podcasting so thanks for that boom um, you can find me on Twitter at Viewpoint Gaming and on Mr. Tushi's Saturday Community Gaming Nights. And, uh, yeah, boom, that's about it. And all I want to say is thanks and have a great weekend, everyone, and see you again next week. Well, yeah, thank you so much for being here, brother. Definitely appreciate what you bring to this show. And, everyone, listen, I want to say thank you again, especially for the Super Chats that came in 
Of course, I want to thank the channel members that continue to support Double Barrel Gaming financially. It is greatly and truly appreciated. And of course, again, uh, before you get on out of here, please consider hitting that like button. And uh, I'm going to close out the show with something that is important to me. Hopefully, one day, it'll be important to you. And that's something that my dear old dad taught me. And I say this all the time, and I'll never get tired of saying this. I think that this world needs it more now than ever. And he used to say, son, treat others how you want to be treated. And also, it doesn't cost anything to be nice. You live by those rules, and I can guarantee you, you're going to have an awesome day. So take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week on the newest and hottest place to get Xbox news, reviews, and opinions, the Xbox Factor Podcast. Take care, everyone. Hey!